It all starts with Baki, our protagonist, who is cornered by these thugs, but he doesn't flinch at all, since they are actually the ones who are afraid of him. After Baki bids them farewell, a limousine arrives at his school. Mitsunari Takigawa, the 11th head of the Takigawa family, gets out of the limousine. He also runs the Subway Stadium, a place used for combat. When Mitsunari meets Baki, he shows him a block of explosives and tells him that it is nitroglycerin. However, he euphorically explains that it is not just any nitroglycerin, but that this glycerin is crystallized. The old man tells him that many years ago was something impossible, but that at the beginning of the 20th century something changed while transporting a shipment that suffered an accident, and although it did not explode when it was opened, they realized that it had been crystallized, and that from that day on all the glycerin had begun to crystallize. He then tells her that very strong men will be arriving in Tokyo in the next few days. Then the story takes us to a prison in the United States, where we see a dangerous and famous convict being escorted by a group of security guards. Upon arrival, the convict walks towards his apparent end, while the man asks him if he has any last words. There we learn that the convict's name is Dorian, and that his last words were literally, I want to know defeat. After this, the convict receives his sentence. Exactly 10 minutes later, a doctor enters to verify Dorian's death, but while listening to his heart, Dorian wakes up and kills everyone in the room. When the others enter to check that everything is alright, they see the massacre and a message from Dorian on the wall that says, see you in Tokyo. Baki is surprised to hear the story, but the old man tells him that it's only the beginning. After this, the story takes us to a Scottish prison, where Doyle says exactly the same words as Dorian as he awaits his end sitting in the electric chair. The man in front of him taunts him by saying that this will probably be his defeat, and then gives the signal to begin. Doyle begins to receive a large electric shock, but even that is not enough to end his life as he breaks free of the restraints and attacks the guards, still allowing the one he was taunting to at least defend himself with his weapon. At the end, Doyle tells him that if he had electrocuted him for 10 more seconds, his last words would probably have come true. The next convict is Sikorsky who has escaped from a prison in Russia, which surprises the guards as he was literally able to climb a 100-meter smooth wall, proving that his physical qualities are on another level. While searching for Sikorsky to convict him, they come across the lifeless body of Garland, their national hero. In addition, an intimidating message on the wall professes, I'm going east to meet defeat. At another prison, a lawyer drops off his belongings while explaining to the detective that he knows he is about to meet a brutal criminal, but he is in an armored acrylic prison and he is a black belt in karate. The detective shows him a picture of the lawyer who went to see Speck last year as a warning, which horrifies the young lawman, so he decides to leave out anything Speck could use as a weapon. When the lawyer arrives at the cell, he begins to tremble and warns the detective that Speck is not there, then the detective grabs him by the neck and rips out his dentures while screaming that he will travel west to meet his defeat. In another prison, a convict awaits sentencing while the guards talk about how he took out 10 men using Olme gas. Obviously, they look surprised as that man seems to be quite small and old to have such capabilities. Ryuku Yanaiji stands up from his chair and walks towards the guards as he asks them what the most poisonous gas on the planet is, but they panic and point their guns at him. Yanaiji explains to them that it is an armored glass, although for him it is like a normal one since he can create an extreme vacuum to break it and immediately begins to do it until it breaks completely. When he leaves, he kills one guard with a single blow, while the other one simply breathes in his ear, exhaling some kind of poisonous gas that kills him instantly. As he leaves, we see that Yanagi has written on a sheet of paper that he is leaving for the capital to learn his defeat. Mitsuneri ends up telling Baki that five unrelated convicts wrote the same words and asks him if he knows what that means. Despite the story Mitsuneri tells Baki, Baki still doesn't understand that all those convicted fighters are going to Tokyo to fight him. Days later, a kickboxer trains quietly, but Doyle shows up to make a surprise attack. The kickboxer tries to avoid the confrontation as he doesn't think it's right to fight an amateur. However, Doyle provokes him and the kickboxer accepts the challenge, realizing almost immediately that he is not fighting a novice. Frightened by Becky's strength, the bullies begin recruiting gang members to carry out an ambush. After this, one of them goes in search of Baki to ask him to accompany him to the bullies. When they meet, Baki defeats them as if it were a game even though they were literally trying to finish him off. As the thug points a gun at Baki, Baki recognizes Speck behind him. Speck asks him to give him his gun, then shoots him in his own cheeks several times in a row, proving that humans can have cheeks of steel if we put our minds to it. Speck hits Baki, leaving him on the ground and surprised by his attack. Then the police arrive and the criminal says goodbye to Baki with one last punch. Becky's father watches the news while training. In addition, it is revealed that this man is feared by all, as he is literally at an unimaginable level of strength and has earned the fear and respect of all. 
Days later, Gyanagi finds himself in a dojo with Shibukawa, the founder of Jiu-Jitsu, whom he once had the opportunity to defeat and whom he seeks out again to fight with his new fighting style. Meanwhile, in another dojo, we see Orochi Katsumi training Jinzen Karat, a technique created by Orochi Dapo that focuses on extracting internal force and turning it into aura, better known as a lethal weapon in Karat. But at the end, despite not appearing to be injured, both bleed, Katsumi being defeated by Kayo. While Katsumi speaks, Dorian enters the dojo looking for Dapo Orochi. When Katsumi sees Dorian, the first thing he asks him to do is take off his boots to enter the dojo, but Dorian attacks him unawares, leaving him badly injured. Dorian tries to leave, but Kayo stands in his way, ready to exact revenge. After this, Dorian begins to cry and surprisingly attacks with one of his hair. Finally, Dorian sets the place on fire and escapes. Meanwhile, Baki takes an aptitude test at school, but being so strong, he does everything in a huge way. In a final 1500-meter test, despite his efforts, he fails as his daily training does not include running races. Elsewhere, Mitsumere meets with a candidate to fight the criminals who have escaped. Tagioka tells the old man that he is ready to fight as soon as he tells him. Sikorsky appears behind Tatioka to start fighting but leaves disappointed when he realizes that the candidate has a pupper fighting level. The old man takes Sikorsky to the subway stadium where, attracted by the thirst for blood and fighting, all the fugitives meet. Baki and Dapo also appear, accompanied by other fighters. In the subway stadium, the old man tells them that some time ago a fight was held in which Baki emerged victorious among 38 participants. He also makes it clear that the fight has no rules, and that they can attack at any time and place. As they leave the stadium, Orochi follows Dorian to begin their first battle, while Retsu stands in their way seeking revenge for what happened at the dojo. Dapo hits Dorian with his backpack, but Dorian attacks him by setting his opponent on fire but to no avail as Orochi uses a defense technique to put it out. Meanwhile, Sikorsky is attacked by Tadioka's men who cut him down thinking it was all too easy. We see Orochi again whose hand is unexpectedly cut off by Dorian, only using a wire. But Orochi explains to him that he always believed that if he had no hands he could hit with full force, thus avoiding breaking his fingers, so after thanking him he leaves him on the ground with a blow to the face and escapes. Sikorsky pretends to be helpless as he is taken to the dojo, and after Tedioka shoots him in the chest several times, he tells him that he knows he is faking. This causes Sikorsky to break free and finish them off, even after Tatioka gives up and asks him to let him go. The next day, Baki walks by a girl named Kozu Matsumoto. Baki tells her that he has long wanted to ask her out and she blushes, telling him that he knows how to make a woman happy. At that moment, some thugs corner them trying to steal their money, but seeing the look on Baki's face, the criminals panic and leave the young men alone. At night, as the two return home holding hands, Speck watches them with a twisted smile on his face. As they walk, Kozu tells Baki that she can't stop thinking about what she did in the hallway of the stadium and we see some images that take us back to that moment when she sadly told him that in the midst of the desire that men had to be the strongest, they never thought about their families or friends. It is then that Baki unexpectedly responds with a chest move and kisses her separating to tell her that this is the path he has chosen at the age of 17. Back in the present, Baki kisses her again, but at that instant we see Speck behind Kozu. Despite believing he has caught them off guard, Baki watches him with a sharp look, knowing he is looking to fight, but at that moment, Kaoru takes Speck away. Already away from Baki, Speck tells Kaoru that he is the most like the convicts, and then kicks him in the face, but through it all the Yakuza remains calm and decides to take off his clothes, revealing thousands of scars and a tattoo that takes up his entire back. We then see a memory of Kaosu, in which he tells his men that the tattoo is not yet complete. Hours later, they find him in the middle of a massacre made by himself in the base of the Tomozawa, who had killed their former boss. Upon seeing him, they see that his body is covered by multiple cuts, which according to him have completed his tattoo. In New York, a guard watches over the Statue of Liberty until he notices that someone has been cutting it and is about to crumble. In Segovia, some very strong marines help put it together with chains and padlocks. Meanwhile, Speck keeps hitting Koru non-stop as he cannot breathe for five minutes and keep attacking, but just when he thought his opponent was finished, Kaoru with a single power-packed punch drives him away. On the other hand, the special units are looking for a way to catch Speck, but even the best team has not been able to prevent this criminal from finishing them off. Kaoru starts hitting Speck, who can only respond to her blows with dirty tricks, exploding bullets in his attacker's mouth. Despite having his jaw shattered by the explosion, Kaoru beats Speck again and hands him over to the police. But while he was retreating in a police car, Speck attacks him again by shooting him in his legs. Peck again tries to shoot in Kaoru's mouth, but Kaoru deflects the bullet into the holes he already had from the explosion. 
When it looked like the end was near, Kelro attacks again, hitting his head as if he were a nutcracker. In the middle of the blow, Speck covers his eyes and a stun grenade explodes which is used to immobilize but which doesn't affect someone like Hanayama, although it obviously made him close his eyes long enough for Speck to escape from her grip and grab him from behind. Despite that, a cop tells that Kaoru has a grip that is impossible to measure, and that a few years ago, a lightweight wrestler who retired when he started to qualify to heavier categories because he had an encounter with Kaoru in which Kaoru had shattered his arm. This technique, called compressive grappling, is the same technique he uses on spec by ripping chunks out of his flesh. To stop him, the criminal sticks one of his fingers into his ear burying up to his brain, but still unable to stop Kaoru's attack, who compressed his neck until finally fulfilling his dream of knowing defeat. At the hospital, we see a totally skeletal man on a gurney and surprisingly, is Speck. The doctor can't explain this phenomenon as his patient a few days ago looked like a 50-year-old man, but now he has deteriorated to the point of looking almost 100 years old. The doctor in charge tells his colleague that in 1976, a treasure hunter named Jack Lee Beyond found a sunken ship off the coast of California that he had been searching for 30 years ago. The ship recovered 200 boxes of gold, jewelry, and antiques. It was said that this treasure was valued at 700 billion yen, and that after learning of this, Jack had felt a sense of accomplishment, but that unexpectedly, after several days, he had turned up dead. Days later, the doctors reveal that by searching through his documents, they find the shocking news that the man was actually 88 years old. The doctor explains to his colleague that there is no proof of this, but that if it is real, what ended Jack's life was that he had fulfilled his dream and no longer had a motivation to live. While Baki is in his class, the teacher notices that he is tired and has barely written his name on the exam. So he asks him why he doesn't quit school and train for the Olympics, but before he answers, he gives him a sermon explaining that no matter how much strength he has, he cannot achieve things beyond his capabilities. As he tells him that even if Bolt ran the entire track and jumped, he couldn't make it to his classroom, Doyle with a single leap demolishes the professor's words. As Doyle speaks, Baki pretends to cry and attacks him by kicking his desk over him. After Baki hits Doyle, the student decides not to continue the battle in the middle of class and throws himself out of the window running far away. However, a few meters away from the school, Baki is surprised by Yanagi, who is using a gardener's disguise as an alibi. Yanagi attacks Baki using a pair of chain scythes, just to test the boy's skills. In fact, Yanagi gives one of the scythes to Baki to further test him, taking the initiative of the fight and attacking Baki violently. However, the fight is suddenly interrupted by an unknown man, who plays a practical joke on Yanagi and subsequent to that literally gives him a humiliating beating. However, Yanagi quickly responds, injuring the stranger's arm and leaving him completely bloodied, revealing that the stranger used to be Yanagi's teacher, who scolds his ex-pupil for attacking his opponents with concealed weapons. After this, Baki and Sensei join forces to fight Yanagi. Although this seemed more than enough to keep the criminal in check, Yanagi manages to break free from his Sensei's grip. After this, the master quickly warns Baki that Yanagi's specialty is not concealed weapons, taking the opportunity to introduce Yanagi as the Poisoner. In fact, seconds after the master's warnings, Yanagi begins to blur all the air around him as he walks in Baki's direction, and after giving him a series of riddles, attacks the young fighter, almost imperceptibly. Meanwhile, a group of doctors tends to a man who fell under Yanagi's poisoning in prison. Despite being a gigantic former sumo wrestler, the man succumbed completely to Yanagi's techniques, to the point of being traumatized and frightened. Back at the school, Yanagi reveals that his fame technique literally consists of decreasing the percentage of oxygen found in the air in order to cause immediate decompensation in his victims. Yanagi explains that air has 21% oxygen in its composition, and that human beings begin to weaken when the amount of oxygen in the air is less than 15%, suffering nausea, dizziness, and in the best of cases, loss of consciousness. Thanks to his training, Yanagi has managed to generate a vacuum in the palms of his hands, reducing the amount of oxygen to 6%. In fact, Yanagi demonstrates his incredible technique and chills his master to the bone. Baki wakes up just in time to see Yanagi fleeing the scene, as the police had arrived on the scene. The next day, Baki attends a meeting planned by Takugawa, as the old man wanted to inform them of his discomfort. However, the meeting is interrupted by Dorian, who managed to infiltrate the place without trouble. His plan to set the place on fire is interrupted by Katsumi, who stealthily arrives on the scene and manages to stop Dorian. In fact, Katsumi's determination has matured so much that she has no problem giving Dorian a spoonful of his own medicine. Obviously, this is not enough to put an end to the most hateful and despicable character in the Anon. Dapo and Retsu would literally pay to beat Dorian up, but Katsumi asked them to give Katu, one of Dapo's most talented apprentices, a chance. 
Keita proves that he was the one who corrupted Katsuni's ideology of martial arts as he doesn't hesitate for a second to use much more than his fists to harm Dorian. However, they are both caught by one of Dorian's tricks, and Dapo shows them why they are apprentices and he is in master. Dapo teaches them that it is not wrong to use weapons in combat, but they should only do so once they are able to use their own body as a weapon. Finding himself outmatched, the despicable Dorian uses another of his tricks to escape the place. After this, he takes refuge in his subway lair where he has the necessary items to heal his wounds. However, he had noticed that Katu was already there. Logically, Katu has no idea of Dorian's true abilities, who confesses that he has not seen even a small percentage of what he is capable of. To everyone's surprise, Kato gives Dorian an unprecedented beating, to the point that the despicable Dorian begins to beg for mercy. However, it was all just an illusion. Dorian reveals that he is able to hypnotize his rivals, making them live for a few seconds their deepest desires. He used Kato's heart's desires to hypnotize him, clearly demonstrating that Dorian is on another level. After this, Kato suffers a violent and humiliating defeat. As if he didn't have enough reason to hate Dorian, Retsu finds Kato in a punching bag, so he rushes to take him to the hospital. After this, Dorian becomes the number one enemy of the entire Shin Shin Kai, the Karat Dojo led by Dapo. This style of Karat has over 10,000 members all over Japan, so they will do anything to find Dorian. In fact, it doesn't take long for the Shin Shin Kai to find Dorian. As he leaves a restaurant, he is intimidated by the entire organization. Dorian quickly realizes the situation he is in, as the cab driver reveals to him that literally the entire road is filled with Shin Shin Ka members. Obviously, the cab driver does not take Dorian to the requested destination, but instead takes him to a strange amusement park, where he is greeted by a huge crowd of Shin Shin Kai members, who reveal that they only fulfill their mission of escorting him to the location. Dorian provokes the crowd by thanking them, as he had been looking forward to going to that amusement park for a long time. He also beats up one of the young men to show that they couldn't beat him even if they all attacked him at the same time. Entering the amusement park, Dorian enjoys the rides like a kid. Obviously, he is quickly intercepted by Itsushi Suido, a close friend of Kato's. Dorian makes Sul to believe that he is running for his life, but he was only planning to take the young man on a roller coaster to test his determination, as the young man had mentioned that he would have no problem losing his life. The scene becomes almost terrifying as Dorian torments the young man, who slowly begins to take courage as he sees that he is able to beat Dorian. However, the despicable Dorian uses another of his dirty tricks and tears Suldo apart. Katsumi witnesses all this together with Dapo and Retsu, so she swears that she will end Dorian's life no matter what, as he is despicable. Dorian provokes the young man by telling him that Retsu thinks differently. A flashback reveals that, in the past, Retsu was constantly scolded by his master, as he was a promising and talented, but extremely undisciplined young man. The old man took Retsu to a secret place inside the temple to tell him the story of the strongest warrior he ever saw, Kayo Dorian. Dorian achieved feats never before seen in the temple, but his promising future was cut short by his disrespect for the martial arts and his corrupt way of looking at fights. Back in the present, both martial arts enthusiasts acknowledge their accomplishments, but Retsu confesses that he does not intend to fight a member of his brotherhood, much less a man who earned the respect and admiration of all. Obviously, Katsumi tries to take advantage of the situation to take over Dorian himself, but his plans are thwarted almost immediately, as there is no person more eager to fight that battle than Dapo Orochi. A flashback reveals that, just hours after losing his hand, Dapo visited an old friend who tends clandestinely in the suburbs. The cutting-edge, experimental knowledge of Dapo's personal physician is so incredible that in just a few hours of surgery, Dapo fully regained the mobility of his hand. Seeing this, Dorian formally accepts Dapo's fight and proceeds to remove his shirt. Only moments later, the odious and despicable Dorian begins his quips, filling the place with acid. Meanwhile, Baki and Kubazu have a romantic and innocent encounter, as they both confess that they haven't been bored at any point since they started meeting. In fact, they both seal the moment with a kiss and continue strolling around the city, unaware that Yujiro is watching them. On the other hand, the fight between Dapo and Dorian unfolds in an unusual way for Katsumi and Retsu, as Dapo punches the air as if he is hypnotized. Obviously, Dorian reveals his strange hypnosis technique, and they are both dumbfounded, as Dapo is completely unprotected. However, to Dorian's surprise, Dapo continues to defend himself intuitively, as if his body is capable of protecting itself. Dapo begins to pulverize Dorian's bones violently, giving him a hellish flurry of blows that is capable of completely destroying Dorian's spine and ribs. In fact, the despicable Dorian is not even able to react to Dapo's brutality and continues to suffer the consequences of provoking the Shin Shin Kai leader. 
With his bones shattered, Dorian actually seemed to be on the verge of death for the first time in his life, but Dapo surprises everyone by inviting Kato to deliver the final blow to Dorian. However, seeing that he really had no chance of escaping, Dorian gives up and starts crying, which makes Dapo laugh. To everyone's surprise, upon seeing the scans of Dorian's body, the doctor discovers that the despicable Dorian still had an ace up his sleeve, but for some reason he didn't use it in his fight. To everyone's disgrace, Dorian is still able to stand up despite being completely destroyed. In fact, Dorian suddenly gets up from his gurney to check on Kato's physical condition and runs out of the hospital. As if able to sense his presence, Dapo feels uneasy upon arriving home and his suspicions are confirmed moments later as Dorian ambushes him using the ace of his sleeve that the doctor had seen in the x-rays. On the other hand, Baki continues her romantic trace with Kozu. However, neither of them is able to admit that they want to spend the night together, so they end up saying goodbye in a tense and sudden manner. On the other hand, Retsu meets Dorian minutes after the ambush and manages to put an end to the despicable, cheating and dirty Dorian we all know. Retsu destabilizes Dorian by breaking his psyche, telling him that he always sought to be defeated, but the reality is that he never experienced victory, as he never won without cheating, so he's a failure. Dorian admits defeat and Retsu sentences Dorian with a single blow. After this, it is revealed that Retsu accompanies Dorian in the ambulance, and although the policemen and doctors are trembling with fear, they soon realize that Retsu's words are real. Dorian is no longer the same as before and his mind has become like that of a child, as Dorian's mental health depended on his victories, and after understanding that he never won a real fight, Dorian's psyche collapsed. Meanwhile, Kazu wonders if she should go to Becky's house to spend the night together, but Sikorsky suddenly bursts into her room and takes her hostage, promising her that he won't do anything to her mother if she keeps quiet. Despite the horrible situation and Sikorsky's bullying, Kazu remains relatively calm, which surprises the criminal. Baki suddenly enters the scene and begins to frantically beat Sikorsky up as he cannot believe that Sikorsky has done something so low and cowardly. However, Sikorsky proves that there are no limits for him and takes Kozu away as soon as he gets the chance to do so, which drives Baki crazy. The next day, it is revealed that the top brass of the Japanese police have arranged a meeting with the heads of the American and Russian special forces as criminals are wreaking havoc in the country. Although they were able to catch Dorian and Speck, they cannot take credit for it, so they must take drastic measures to put an end to the situation. Russia's chancellor asks the FBI director to make his strongest weapon available. This leaves everyone shocked, so the director reveals that a maximum security prison located in Arizona houses a man who could be the solution to the conflict. Semenino arrives on U.S. soil to meet personally the man who could end the conflict. As soon as he arrives at the airport, Sonoda is escorted by Michael Halls to the prison, revealing that the prisoner he is about to meet is aware of everything that is going on. Upon arrival, Sonoda notices that Biscuit Oliva, the prisoner he is about to meet, is living like a celebrity. In fact, it would seem that Oliva is the real boss of the prison, as he comes and goes as he wishes, plus they fulfill his every wish. Sonoda is perplexed at the sight of Oliva, as his presence is frightening. However, to Sonoda's surprise, Oliva is extremely diplomatic. In fact, Oliva resolves Sonoda's doubts by explaining that he was the one who imprisoned all the prisoners who are in Arizona, making it clear that he's a bounty hunter. Biscuit Oliva gets a call and asks Sonoda to hurry up and leave the place as they have a case. The two board a helicopter and speed off to the city center, where they are expected by the police force. Upon arrival, Oliva leaves the cops speechless, as he acts with firmness and determination, infiltrating the place calmly, as if he wasn't the least bit afraid. Oliva quickly encounters Jeff Markson, the man responsible for the whole mess. Jeff was a dirty cop who almost lost his life at Oliva's hands, so he spent 24 years of his life planning his revenge. As expected, Jeff's intentions are not enough to harm Oliva, who is considered a war machine. In fact, Jeff uses a plan B to culminate his revenge, but Oliva gives him a reality check and defeats him in one move. This perplexes everyone in the compound as Jeff did not lose his life from the fall, but died as a result of the blow. After this, Sonoda and Oliva return to the prison, where Oliva recovers in a matter of seconds. The next day, Sonoda and Oliva travel to Japan to begin the hunt. However, Oliva suddenly abandons the car due to a strange hunch. Such a hunch is linked to Sikorsky, who is holding Kozu hostage. In addition, Sikorsky asks Yujiro for help in finding Baki, but Yujiro only agrees on the condition that he guarantees Kozu's safety. However, Sikorsky believes that Yujiro is a better opponent and seizes the moment to challenge him, but Yujiro doesn't even flinch. In fact, Oliva arrives at that precise moment and takes charge of the situation, politely greeting Yujiro, as the two seem to have known each other for a long time. Sekorsi immediately realizes that he is in front of Biscuit Oliva, the man they call the Unchained, due to his immunity to the wall. 
Obviously, having two opponents of that caliber gets Sikorsky extremely excited, but everything changes immediately for him as Baki arrives on the scene at that very moment. Enraged, Baki starts hitting Sikorsky violently and after an incredible blast, throws Sikorsky into the air. This causes Oliva to praise him as Baki has ended another person's life for the first time. This upsets Baki, so he starts punching Oliva, though Oliva completely ignores him. Sikorsky quickly returns to the scene, revealing that he is able to climb any surface with no problem as he has superhuman strength in his fingers. The two continue the fight immediately, but are quickly interrupted by the police, which is why Sikorsky leaves the scene. Obviously, Baki chases Sikorsky all over the city and finds him a few hours later, so he doesn't hesitate for a second to carry out the third round. Baki takes the initiative in the fight and attacks his rival with determination. Sikorsky literally can't catch a break as Baki pounds him relentlessly. Oliva arrives at that precise moment and congratulates Baki for his display. He also asks him to let him take care of business as he must imprison Sikorsky. This offends Baki greatly, but Oliva again ignores his immature behavior. However, Sikorsky is also offended as Oliva takes it for granted that he is stronger than him. Obviously, the criminal proves almost immediately that Oliva's words were not about arrogance, as the famous bounty hunter literally is on another level. After this, Oliva notifies Sinaba that he will find the other two prisoners very soon. He also takes the opportunity to thank Baki, since he made his job easier. Obviously, Baki is no longer behaving like a child and recognizes Oliva's bestial strength. After this, the bounty hunter begins to exhaustively study Doyle, his next target, unaware that he is closer than he thinks. Doyle infiltrates Oliva's office dressed in a strange but effective way and seizes the exact moment to strike. Obviously, Oliva celebrates what has just happened, as she believes her job has been made easier with Doyle's early appearance. However, Doyle wouldn't be so brainless as to show up on the scene without an ace of his sleeve, so he reveals that he poisoned Oliva with a painkiller when he hit him. Although Doyle capitalizes on this and cuts Oliva's face again, it's not enough to overpower the notorious biscuit Oliva. The bounty hunter fiends defeat, but uses the alibi to counterattack. Oliva's attack is so brutal and devastating that it reverberates throughout the compound, so a group of police officers come to the scene to check the situation. To prevent the fight from coming to an end, Oliva makes up an excuse and drives the policeman away. Miraculously, Doyle didn't lose his life in Oliva's attack and manages to attack again, which puts Oliva's hype through the roof. Unfortunately for them, they have to postpone the match as Sonoda and Shibikawa enter the scene surprisingly. Oliva makes up an excuse to get out of the predicament and tells them that he got into an altercation with a policewoman. Also, upon seeing Shibukawa, Oliva shows admiration and respect by praising the old man's abilities. On the other hand, it is revealed that Doyle used the ventilation duct to escape, and once outside the police station, he used the subway train. Meanwhile, Oliva asks Sonoda to allow him to train Judo with the officers at the station, as they are Shibukawa's students, and he has always dreamed of getting a black belt. Oliva puts on the biggest suit in the place and it still fits him too small, so he proceeds to tear it to feel comfortable. Everyone tries to explain to him that he won't be able to get a black belt in one day, as things don't work that way in the martial arts world, but Oliva is extremely determined to achieve his dream. Obviously, he makes it clear that his strength is on another level, and he doesn't need special techniques to win. In fact, Oliva beats the strongest, tallest, and most capable fighter in the entire dojo with no problem at all. As if that weren't enough, Oliva spends the afternoon effortlessly beating students, which outrages Sonoda as a rookie is humiliating the entire dojo. However, charged with defending the dojo's honor is Shibikawa, who jumps into the ring to show his students why he is the dojo's master. This gets everyone's hype in the air, although the most excited is Oliva, who doesn't hesitate for a second to take the initiative. However, Shibikawa demonstrates his virtuosity by being able to break free from Oliva's grip. Strangely, Oliva gives up the idea of getting the black belt, although he reveals almost immediately that Shibikawa dislocated his wrist. However, the old man awards him the belt anyway. Meanwhile, Shinoji Kosho gives an exhibition of talent and discipline to several Shin 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 Kai members, as they need to regain their confidence. Also, a meeting between Kosho and Katsumi reveals that the truth behind all this is that Kosho wants to face Doyle to take revenge. On the other hand, Doyle shows his body modifications to Gary, the American Navy captain. He also explains to him that the blades won't activate unless he uses the switch he has on his pinky finger. The conversation is interrupted by Kosho, who arrives on the scene in a defiant manner. In fact, after punching Gary, Kosho lunges at Doyle before Doyle could do anything. Doyle is out of breath after taking a blow of such magnitude, but like every Baki Hama character, he is excited about facing an up-and-coming opponent. 
Nevertheless, Kasho continues to sweep the floor with Doyle, as Doyle doesn't quite get his oxygen back. Meanwhile, Kozu and Baki spend the afternoon talking about what happened with Sikorsky, but are suddenly interrupted by Hanayama, who asks Baki a deep and uncomfortable question. This outrages Baki and offends Kozu, as Hanayama literally insinuates that if what Baki is looking for is to lose his V-card, there is no need for him to play with Kozu's feelings, as he can help him get a waifu. Hanayama and Baki are dumbfounded by Kozu's reaction as the waifu shows impressive maturity, very diplomatically replying Hanayama's proposal. In fact, after the waifu showed determination, Hanayama realizes that Baki chose her life partner well. On the other hand, the fight between Kosho and Doyle reaches its climax, as Doyle was able to react to his rival's relentless attacks. However, like any martial artist, Kosho doesn't imagine what his opponents are capable of, so he receives a horrifying reality check. In fact, this outrages Gary as he can't believe that Doyle thinks he's strong by fighting so unfairly. Obviously, Doyle doesn't see what the problem is with his fighting, since he has never lost a fight. However, Gary fails to understand Doyle's philosophy of playing dirty and continues to insist that he is really a loser. On the other hand, Baki spends the night thinking about Kozu's words, but is surprisingly interrupted by none other than the waifu, who wants to express everything she feels. To Baki's surprise, Kozu's feelings are the same as his, so the two decide to spend the night together. Obviously, nerves affect both of them greatly, so they spend a long time analyzing the situation, trying to gather courage to take the first step. When Baki makes up his mind, he gets the most unwelcome and strange surprise of the anime. Yujiro was watching everything. Logically, their nerves turn to tension at the sight of Baki's father. Strangely, Yujiro tells them not to hesitate for a second to experience love at its best, congratulating them for ignoring society's teachings. After this, Yujiro leaves the room. Despite seeing that his father felt proud for him, Baki tells Kozu that he will be sure to take the next step when they meet again. The next day, Retsu sees a gigantic man devour a roast pig in 10 minutes. To his surprise, the man is none other than Jack Hama. For some reason, Jack has grown tremendously in every way, which Retsu misses. However, a later scene reveals that Jack underwent painful surgery at the hands of Korea to make his body grow. Upon leaving the restaurant, Retsu meets Doyle in the elevator, which sparks a tense atmosphere. Curiously, Doyle invites Retsu to a bar. Upon arriving, they both order their respective drinks and talk about the fight Doyle had against Kosho, which sparks chaos between the two almost immediately. To Doyle's surprise, Retsu quickly took advantage in the fight as he was able to preempt Doyle's every spurious move. In fact, Retsu fights fire with fire and subdues Doyle in brutal fashion. In fact, Retsu continues to dominate the battle with determination as if he was able to anticipate Doyle's moves. After an incredible display of talent, Retsu leaves Doyle on the verge of defeat. However, Jack Hama suddenly appears and uses a sleeping pill to knock Retsu unconscious. Far from wanting to take advantage of the situation, Jack tells Doyle that he will have to give him a good fight in the future. However, as Doyle leaves the scene, he sees a group of gang members trying to take advantage of Retsu, so he beats them up and decides to stay the night at the scene, despite his deplorable condition. Upon waking up, Retsu immediately understands the situation and is perplexed, as Doyle was left on the verge of death to help him. Immediately after, Retsu runs through the entire city at supersonic speed, while dodging all sorts of obstacles to tend to Doyle as quickly as possible. Just as happened with Retsu a few hours ago, Doyle quickly understands the situation. In fact, his suspicions are confirmed when he sees Retsu coming through the door. Nevertheless, Doyle leaves the scene as soon as he feels a little better. Proving that he is a criminal with a completely twisted mind, Doyle goes to the Shin Shin Kai Dojo to thank the students for what they did for him as they were the ones who donated blood to save him. As a token of thanks, Doyle sets the place on fire and sows chaos. Doyle obviously leaves the place unharmed, but it probably won't last him too long as he encounters Dapo Orochi. However, despite Doyle being responsible for destroying his dojo, Dapo Orochi does not immediately lash out, but decides to take the fight elsewhere. Dapo persuades Doyle by telling him that he is a coward incapable of fighting without weapons, which provokes the young criminal. In fact, feeling slighted by an old man, Doyle agrees to fight without weapons, but Dapa gives him a tremendous beating. Upon waking up, Doyle sees Katsumi in front of him, so he senses the imminent danger surrounding him. Katsumi explains to him that they are in the Shin Shin Kai Dojo, the place he set on fire just a few hours ago. Despite having burns all over his body, Katsumi doesn't look angry, but he is determined to break Doyle's pride. In fact, he knocks Doyle out with a kick and tells him that he will keep doing that until he admits defeat. A few hours later, Doyle regains consciousness again and, as expected, Katsumi bids him good morning with a beating. 
Meanwhile, Kozu gives a demonstration of how a man has to be woken up as he writes a beautiful letter for Baki to pick up the next day at his doorstep. Obviously, as soon as he finishes reading the letter, Baki starts looking for Kozu all over town, as that's what the waifu had asked him to do in the letter. To the waifu's surprise, Baki solved the riddle without any problems and the two meet, giving us one of the most romantic moments of the anime. Back at the Shin Shin Kai, it is revealed that Katsumi must receive medical treatment to heal his wounds, but even that doesn't limit him from lecturing Doyle. After lunch, Doyle prepares to attack Katsumi, which creates quite a surprise for the young man as Doyle is willing to fight fair. Obviously, Katsumi gives him an incredible beating, making it clear to Doyle that he still has time to admit defeat. Doyle refuses to admit defeat, so Katsumi makes his determination clear and delivers a fatal blow to Doyle's face. To everyone's surprise, Doyle survives and upon awakening from his coma, realizes that Katsumi is no longer on the scene. One of the Shin Shin Kai members tells him that Katsumi gave up the victory as he wasn't able to take her life with that punch. This perplexes Doyle as the clear loser of the match was him and not Katsumi, who demands too much of himself. This teaches Doyle a lesson, so he decides to go after Katsumi. This surprises Katsumi, as Doyle literally accepts his defeat. Kumamatsu explains to Mitsunari the martial art move Kudo, also known as the Poison Hand. The procedure to master the deadly technique is extremely complex and Jianaji must alter the sand using insects, because the sand absorbs the venom of such insects. After this, Yanagi must hit the poison sand day and night for 7 minutes during the day and 9 minutes at night. Finally, Yanagi must hit a purifying potion to obtain the toxin. Mouth agape, Mitsunari asks what would happen if Yanagi were to touch a human, to which Kunamatsu replies that he is capable of rotting anything with his hands alone. This horrifies Mitsunari, but after all, wrestlers train to finish off their opponents. Elsewhere, a group of police officers discuss how it could be that an impenetrable detention camp capable of holding the world's most fearsome criminals could not contain Sikorsky, who scaled a smooth 150-meter wall with his fingers alone. Baki is about to explode as he is alone with Kozu, and the reason is more than obvious. Feeling the warmth of his waifu, Baki silently suffers the worst of his fears, as his nerves might play a trick on him. Yanagi takes advantage of the situation to rebuke Baki, as he knows that Baki spent the whole night fighting the most passionate and satisfying fight of his life. This surprises Baki, as Yanagi did not take advantage of the opportunities he had to attack in his moments of vulnerability. Without a second thought, Baki tells Yanagi that there will be a better time to fight, which blows Yanagi away as he senses an abysmal change in Baki. Yanagi realizes that Baki has changed, that he is no longer a mere teenager. Moreover, she congratulates him for being able to fall in love with a waifu as beautiful as Kozu. In fact, it is Kozu who encourages Baki to take the initiative. On the other hand, Kumimatsu explains to Mitsunari what the power of relaxation is capable of exemplifying Yanagi's whip-like strikes, as Yanagi is able to move his body as if it were a liquid, as if he were completely invertebrate. In fact, Baki experiences this firsthand as Yanagi hits him with his whip technique and causes horrific injuries. Baki literally loses parts of his skin from these blows, but he seems to ignore this completely. Smiling, Baki tells Yanagi that he has seen that hit before, revealing that he has already heard of the whip hit. Obviously, and this surprises Yanagi, Baki reveals that Yujiro, his father, taught him this technique a long time ago, but that Yujiro deeply despises it, as it is a method of defense used by children and women. Even though his father made it clear to him that real men do not use such techniques, Baki is capable of using the whip strike. Bucky goes through the steps to perform the technique, and immediately afterwards, she rips off a piece of Yanagi's skin. The waifu yells at Baki, be careful because another wrestler is coming with a desire to fight, but the latter also immediately realizes that Baki is no longer a child. In fact, Yanagi quickly makes it clear that Baki has matured. Baki stares intensely at his rivals for a few seconds, as if it were a war. As expected, the sweetest waifu encourages fervently, in fact, Kozu offers to fight side by side with Baki, as it is unfair that he must fight against two opponents, but Baki is sure that he can beat them without problems. Seeing that his opponents are not taking the initiative, Baki decides to make the first move. Sikorsky is dumbfounded to see Baki move with incredible determination. In fact, Baki humiliates them as if it were a children's fight as he slaps them like two amateur fighters. Baki demands them again and again to fight with all their might, making it clear that he will make them no defeat once and for all. This upsets Yananji, so he decides to confront Baki verbally, telling him that he shouldn't think he's a big deal just because he has a girlfriend. However, Yanagi keeps thinking that his venom seems to be useless against Baki. To everyone's surprise, Hanayama appears behind Kozu and as soon as he arrives on the scene, confesses that he too is upset since Baki met Kozu, as he has now become stronger. 
Baki notices Hanayama's presence and greets him cheerfully. Hanayama comments to Baki that he looks too different, but Baki tells him that it doesn't matter if he is stronger or not as all he cares about is being able to protect his loved ones, including himself. Tired of humiliating his opponents, Baki decides to take Kozu and leave the place, leaving Hanayama talking to himself on the spot. Fortunately for them, Hanayama makes it clear to the criminals that he has no intention of fighting. Kozu asks Baki if he's sure about leaving the fight, Baki replies that he doesn't need to win as he runs off with her in his arms. Elsewhere, Hector Doyle and Katsumi talk beside a derelict ship about an important issue. Doyle asks Katsumi for carrot lessons and Katsumi readily agrees. The first thing Katsumi teaches Doyle is his Seiken technique and Doyle begins to imitate it almost immediately. Katsumi carefully observes the rapid progress of his student and after a few moments, Katsumi says goodbye to him emotionally. He also presents him with a black belt. Upon boarding the boat, Doyle gets a big surprise as Yanagi is waiting for him on the spot and before he can notice, Yanagi berates him. Doyle begins to be taunted by Yanagi as he witnessed the emotional farewell between the two and for a criminal of Doyle's level, such an act should be considered shameful. However, Doyle doesn't even pay attention to him and before Doyle stops talking, he uses his glasses to start one of his particular attacks. However, Yanagi manages to successfully counterattack and severely wounds one of Doyle's eyes, causing him to go blind. After this, Yanagi begins to choke Doyle with the belt Katsumi had given him, but Doyle manages to free himself. However, Yanagi throws Doyle off the boat with a violent blow. Obviously, Doyle gets back on the ship, but he gets a big surprise as Yanagi has decided to double down and attacks Doyle with a katana. Fortunately, Doyle has pieces of steel in his body and suffers no serious injuries from Yanagi. Yanagi realizes this and decides to throw another blow with the katana, but Doyle lets go and falls into the water. At Alexander Garland Hospital, we meet a man who was known as the Hero of Russia, but he was defeated by another man, and after this event was never able to regain 100% sanity. The prison that once housed Sekorsky, Russia's greatest criminal, is conducting a series of experiments to discover how Sekorsky could have escaped. Obviously, the conclusion of the experiment is that the criminal escaped thanks to the superhuman strength he possesses in his fingers. On the other hand, Sikorsky and Jack Hamma find themselves in the city, so they decide to find a private place to fight alone. Sikorsky manages to take the first step, demonstrating his determination to make the first move. Obviously, Jack is undeterred and is quick to counterattack, humiliating Sikorsky. Jack chases Sikorsky to a payphone to continue the contest. According to Sikorsky, Jack is limited in a confined place like that, as his body is too robust to move freely in a small place. After this, Sikorsky takes the initiative and begins to strike violently, but his attacks are unsuccessful. In fact, Jack uses logic and manages to defeat Sikorsky in the most epic and humiliating way. Jack exits the cockpit and encounters some agents, who tie up the cockpit to keep Sikorsky locked up. After this, it is revealed that the person behind all this is Igari, a famous wrestler who detests Sikorsky, due to a conflict the two had in the past. While being taken away in a truck, Sikorsky regains consciousness and wonders where he is being taken. His doubts are dispelled moments later as the truck stops, revealing that Sikorsky was transported to a ring solely to continue fighting Jack. Sikorsky doesn't even have time to think as Jack quickly berates him. Mitsunari suddenly appears and explains that he was the organizer of the fight. Furthermore, Mitsunari makes it clear that Sikorsky is free to make a decision, as he is not obliged to fight. Obviously, running away from the fight will be considered a defeat. Although the fight was originally designed to be conducted cleanly, Mitsunari makes it clear that anything is allowed. Jack parries Sikorsky's punches with no trouble and takes advantage of the situation to counterattack. In fact, Jack is able to throw Sikorsky into the stands with a kick, so the Russian criminal takes advantage of the situation to grab a cane, as he has realized that he has no chance to win in an equal fight. Jack ignores this completely and smiling advises Sikorsky to drop the cowardice. As expected, Sikorsky goes ahead with his plan and punches Jack in the abdomen. While this seemed to be enough to end the fight, Jack proves that he is on another level as his muscles completely absorb the damage. Sikorsky throws a nail at him that he had grabbed earlier, but Jack catches it with his teeth. After this, Jack confesses that he has grown bored, revealing that he will be replaced by Gaia, the master fighter. This upsets the audience as Jack was giving them a real show. In addition, they wonder over and over again who Gaia is, however, Mitsunari knows Gaia's talent very well, as he was able to bend Baki in his early days. Upon entering the stadium, Gaia earns hundreds of boos, but with a single shout, she manages to silence the entire stadium. In addition, Gaia takes advantage of the situation to provoke Sikorsky, throwing a knife that was lying on the ground. 
Sikorsky speeds up to grab Gaia, but Gaia pulls out a gun and shoots towards the ground, which irritates the Russian criminal. Gaia tells him that the only thing he will use is the environment he is in and gives him an example by hitting the ring with the palm of his hand throwing sand like solid pieces or nails, which shatters Sikorsky's body. Sikorsky receives several fragments of sand, which look like bullets impacting his body at a high speed, but these projectiles are nothing more than sand debris mixed with pieces of teeth that have been left in the ring. Gaia continues to throw sand, so Sikorsky has no choice but to cover himself. After an intense moment, Gaia stops, and although Sikorsky is extremely hurt, Gaia hasn't even broken a sweat. After this, Gaia uses a curtain of sand to hide her presence, which drives Sikorsky crazy. Gaia starts playing with Sikorsky, making him angry over and over again. Obviously, Sikorsky is extremely humiliated, so he starts yelling at Gaia to stop fighting like that and use traditional martial arts. After this, Gaia fulfills Sikorsky's wish and starts beating him violently, using the sand for camouflage. Gaia stops hiding but continues to beat him. Sikorsky admits defeat and screams for the bout to be stopped, so Mixonary has no choice but to announce the end of the show, even though everyone in the stadium wanted to continue watching the humiliation. Sikorsky is not the last of the criminals to know defeat, as Yanagi is also about to know what it feels like to lose a fight. Yanagi has Yujiro, the final boss of the MIM, in front of him. However, he decides to face him instead of giving up, even though he knows he has no chance of winning. Yujiro turns around and talks to Moto, a Jew, Jitsu fighter, as he is glad that Yanagi told him such a thing. Also, he wonders how the fight will end since there are no rules in that fight. How will they decide then? Both parties have to decide whatever they want, that even in the state that Yanagi was in, that if he does not admit defeat, the fight is not decided, and if Moto stays without the other admitting defeat, the victory of him is not decided. As Yujiro finishes speaking, Shibuko appears saying that he understands why he is there, a monster like Yujiro is there. Yujiro decides to go back to his house, but before he turns around and throws a punch at Yanagi, ending the fight there, while telling him that if he didn't surrender, then he was resisting his challenge. Elsewhere, in a cave near the sea, Doyle does his best to see again, but he realizes that he has not regained his vision since Yanagi's blow. To his surprise, Oliva suddenly appears and greets him kindly. Sensing danger, Doyle asks Oliva if he intends to imprison him, which makes the American laugh as his mission is more than obvious. Moreover, Oliva immediately notices what happened to Doyle, so the young criminal rushes to hit Oliva as he must buy time to escape. However, Oliva manages to deter Doyle's attacks and proves to him that he is on another level. In addition, Oliva realizes that Doyle's eyes are poisoned, so she hugs him tightly and causes him to faint criminally. Oliva makes it clear once again that he is the real boss of the prison, as he uses the lab to get samples of the poison from Doyle's eyes. Unfortunately for him, the scientists confirm Oliva's suspicions. The poison was not produced artificially, but is a mixture of natural poisons that could be lethal if they reach the bloodstream. Meanwhile, Kabuzu asks Baki to be honest about his health, and seeing that his health is completely deteriorated, forces him to go to the hospital. He even tells him that he will inform all his friends of his condition. Baki's doctor tells Kozu that Baki cannot be saved, that the only thing that can save him is a miracle. Kabuzu becomes desperate and starts running to think of a plan, but runs into Muhammad Ali Jir, the son of the legendary boxer. He praises her for how pretty she is and tells her not to give up. Although Ali Jir had stopped to ask Kozu something, he completely forgot what he wanted to know, although he later reveals that he wanted to get to the Tate building. Elsewhere, a group of fighters hold a brutal training session with Dave, a legendary and famous fighter in the area, who takes advantage of the downtime to train as he is waiting for an extremely important person. After this, it is revealed that the fighter Dave was expecting was none other than Ali Jer, who politely apologizes for the delay. Dave tells him that he will wait for him in the ring. He also makes it clear that he will fight to the death. Once in the ring, Dave and Ali Jir battle it out, but after Dave tries to land two punches on Ali Jir, Ali Jir responds masterfully and manages to take Dave down with no trouble. This infuriates Dave, so he plans a new strategy. However, Dave's attempts are almost immediately thwarted by Muhammad Ali Jr. Everyone in the venue is dumbfounded to see this, as Ali Jir's boxing literally looks like something unique. Elsewhere, a journalist arrives at a gigantic mansion to do the interview of a lifetime, Upon entering the place, the journalist realizes that the man in front of him is the strongest and most acclaimed athlete of the entire 20th century, Mr. Muhammad Ali. The journalist makes his fanaticism evident as meeting Muhammad Ali was the dream of his life. As the interview begins, the reporter quickly asks what boxing meant to him, but Ali answers the question using another question, a fact that leaves the reporter surprised as Muhammad Ali asks him if he has heard of Yujiro Hama, the ogre. 
The hospital staff notices that Baki left the compound, but Kazu discovers that he has an alternative plan. Obviously, the waifu decides to accompany him. Yujiro receives a welcome visit from Ali Jer, so he takes advantage of the situation to learn more about the health condition of his father, Muhammad Ali. During the interview, Muhammad reveals that many years ago, he visited Japan to have the fight of his life with Antonio Igare, a great martial artist. However, while training, his partners gradually disappeared. Obviously, someone of Muhammad Ali's strength would not be afraid of anyone, but the horrifying presence of a monster completely transformed the atmosphere of the place. Muhammad instinctively raised his guard, as if he was in danger. Not even the most fearsome boxers had ever managed this, but Yujiro Hama, the man standing in front of Muhammad, was much more than human. However, Yujiro just wanted to congratulate Muhammad for his unique fighting style, which should be considered by martial artists all over the world. This excites Muhammad, as no one has ever noticed this before. To test Muhammad's style, the two have a brief but intense bout, which sends the hype for both of them sky high. Yujiro presents Muhammad's fighting style as Muhammad Ali's mixed martial arts, the most ingenious name ever. However, Yujiro teaches him what the weakness of his style is, telling him that it is obvious that he has not yet been able to perfect his technique. After this, Yujiro congratulates Muhammad Ali and praises him highly, telling him that his passion for fighting is contagious to everyone. Yujiro reveals that his lifelong dream is to become the strongest weapon in history, capable of defeating an army with his bare hands. This touches Muhammad, so he begs him to meet his son. Elsewhere, Baki and Kozu arrive at the home of Ando, a strong man whom Baki considers family. Ando is concerned to see Baki's health condition, so he hurries to make natural medicines to help Baki. Baki and Kozu stay there for several days to undergo Ando's natural treatment, and they also take advantage of the time as if it were a vacation. However, Ando knows that there is nothing he can do for Baki. Again in Muhammad's house, it is revealed that Jira has been practicing his father's style since he was born, but Yujiro gives him a reality check, showing respect for Muhammad Ali. On the other hand, Baki takes Kozu to a cave to meet Yasha Jira, who has a great bond with Baki due to both of them having contempt for Yujiro. However, upon returning to the hut, the two meet Retsu, who uses a facade to knock Baki out and take him to China. Upon waking up, Baki realizes that he is in China and understands the issue immediately. Meanwhile, Retsu tries his best to convince his master of Baki's skills, as he wants to make him participate in the mythical Reitei tournament. The master hesitates, but since Baki was able to defeat Retsu, he decides to test the young fighter's skills to see if he is suitable. In charge of fighting Baki is Cho, one of the temple's most promising students. However, Baki immediately proves that Cho is no match for him, even though Cho is literally one of the contenders to lead the temple in the future. After a brief sparring match, Cho admits that Baki is on another level, so Retsu's teacher decides to accept Baki into the Reitei tournament. The day of the tournament finally arrives, and the announcer introduces each of the participants with much excitement, revealing that the tournament pits the 12 Kayo of China, who are the leaders of the most prestigious temples. In addition, the tournament will feature Kaku, leader of the Kayo and the last winner of the Reitei tournament. This old man is literally 146 years old. After this, Muhammad, Yujiro, and Baki are introduced as guests from abroad. The first bout of the tournament is announced, featuring Ryu and Yujiro. However, the tournament organizers place a test to evaluate Yujiro's conditions before the fight to prevent any fraud, as Ryu is the pride of China. Obviously, Yujiro does not even consider this a worthy test, and, offended by the condescension, destroys all the blocks. Furthermore, since Ryu doesn't think the test was unnecessary, Yujiro defeats him in a cruel, bloody, and humiliating manner, leaving everyone in the stadium dumbfounded. In fact, Retsu arrives in a rage to the ring to challenge Yujiro for the dishonor he caused his master, but Yujiro responds by humiliating Ryu once again, making it clear that he is at an immeasurable level. Moments later, the bout between Muhammad Jira and Joe is announced. After this, Muhammad performs his warm-up, but is quickly interrupted by Kozu, whom he greets cheerfully. The waifu confesses that she and Baki are a couple, so Muhammad vows to pray for Baki to prevent anything bad from happening to him. He also promises to do him as little harm as possible if it's their turn to fight each other. As the fight between Muhammad Jir and Joe begins, the young boxer lashes out at his rival's private parts, foretelling Muhammad's superiority over the prestigious Kayo. In fact, Muhammad didn't give the viewers time to get excited, as he defeated Joe in no time even though the height difference between the two was more than noticeable. Moments later, Baki is interrupted by his girlfriend as he was warming up for the bout he was about to fight. Retsu warns Baki that his opponent is Kaio Lai, the best poison specialist in China. Although he is still suffering from the consequences of the poisoning in the previous season, Baki is excited. 
However, viewers are horrified to see Baki's deplorable state of health. Moreover, Baki's rival is none other than Lai, a referent of the Poison Hand. In fact, Baki experiences this immediately, as Lee fills one of Baki's feet with poison. Obviously, Baki has no choice but to remove the poison from his foot in the most grotesque and efficient manner of all. However, Lai seizes the moment and launches a tremendous flurry of attacks that leaves Baki extremely damaged. In fact, when Baki tries to counterattack, he falls to the ground with a crash, bathing the entire enclosure in blood. Seeing this, Kozu begins to cry inconsolably over the inanimate body of Baki, who literally appears to have lost his life. However, Baki surprisingly gets up and resumes his position in the ring to continue the fight. Yujiro begins to laugh and explains to one of the Kaio that hundreds of years ago, China gave Japan the secrets of the Poison Hand fighting style. However, it only sent him seven of the twelve scrolls that hid the secrets of the fighting art, keeping the other five scrolls for itself. In short, this fighting style is composed of yin and yang, and Baki has incorporated both elements within himself after being poisoned by two different specialists, so he has developed immunity. In fact, Baki is now able to defeat Lai in just a few seconds, earning a standing ovation from the entire stadium thanks to his impressive fighting style. After this, Retsu prepares a large amount of dishes for Baki to help him regain his strength. As expected, the young man devours every single food that is put in front of him to the point of finishing it completely. Then Retsu makes a nutritious concoction based on water and fructose to heal Baki's body completely, which was extremely deteriorated due to the malnutrition he suffered from the poisoning. On the other hand, Kaku tells Yujiro that he will show him what humans are capable of if they master their carnal desires. Kaku enters the ring to fight Samwon, a martial arts prodigy who was named Kayo, at only 25 years old. As expected, Kaku defeats his opponent without any problems. After the fight, Samwon receives a strange visit from Yujiro, who tells him that he still doesn't know how to use disappointment to become stronger. In fact, Yujiro humiliates Samwon again before retreating. At the same time, Baki leaves all the monks speechless, as his physical healing process is incredible, to the point of completely recovering his muscle mass. On the other hand, Gorain prepares for his fight, although all the spectators are worried about his countenance. His opponent is Yo, who does not hesitate for a second to take the initiative. Indeed, after a quick flurry of attacks, Yo gets the victory and earns the stadium's ovation. Biscuit Oliva, Dorian's assistant, approaches him to help him back to his feet, leaving all the spectators confused. Seeing this, Yo becomes enraged and asks Dorian for a rematch, telling him that such a weak man would never have been called to the tournament. However, Oliva replies that, as he can see, Dorian is in a deplorable state of mental health, so he offers to fight in his place. Yo tells Oliva that he will give him the first strike advantage as he considers him inferior. He also reveals that his training has allowed him to develop a physique with diamond-like stamina. Oliva ignores this completely and completely destroys Yo in one move. The stadium is horrified, though Yujiro laughs out loud. After this, Oliva leaves the stage and meets Yujiro, to whom he smiles with complicity. Then the fight between Jaku and Chin is announced by the commentator. Jaku quickly defeats Chin and offers him a job in Japan as he believes he has a lot of potential as a sensei. Meanwhile, Baki takes the opportunity to challenge his father, as he found him in the hallways of the stadium. Obviously, Yujiro teaches his son a tremendous lesson and makes it clear that he still has a lot to learn. On the other hand, Son arrives at the stadium ring to fight against Retsu. This fight was highly anticipated by all the spectators, as both wrestlers are very famous. However, Retsu quickly proves his theory correct, lately, it is easy to get the Kaio title. Tetsuo defeats his opponent without any problems and leaves everyone speechless. Upon leaving the stadium, Retsu is questioned by Kaku. Retsu is extremely candid about the level of the tournament, making Kaku furious with the competition organizers, as the Chinese guests are not truly deserving of the Kaio title. For this, Kaku invites his son Shunsi and his friend Shobun, who will enter the tournament unexpectedly to compete against the foreign wrestlers. To get a spot, Kaku knocks out Mo. In charge of giving the news to the foreign wrestlers is Retsu, who negotiates the format of the tournament to avoid conflict. Yujiro is immediately enthusiastic and accepts the conditions without a second thought. The first representative of the foreign wrestlers is Oliva, who receives warnings from Jaku, as Shobun is world famous. In fact, Shobun has never lost a match in his life, although this doesn't seem to matter to Oliva. As expected, Oliva experiences firsthand the strength of his opponent. Seeing that his conventional style is useless against Shobun, Oliva literally copies his opponent's style, causing Shobun to abandon his relaxed stance for a second. However, Oliva is unable to capitalize on the defensive posture of Shobun, who has mastered the art of counterattacking. Oliva learns from his mistakes and uses Shobun's posture once again just to provoke him. 
After receiving an incredible flurry of punches, Oliva delivers the first accurate attack. Obviously, Oliva sees the effectiveness of his strategy and decides to repeat it. In this way, Oliva humiliates Shobun and leaves everyone dumbfounded thanks to his bestial strength. This infuriates Kaku, who decides to take matters into his own hands for the next few fights. However, his son Shunsai asks him not to make hasty decisions, telling him that the show will still be attractive if from now on all Chinese wrestlers literally finish off their opponents. However, Shunsi's plan falls apart a few minutes later, as his opponent completely destroys him. Baki gives a true display of talent and physical strength, leaving everyone perplexed. Obviously, Kaku is disappointed to see his son's poor performance and asks him never to practice martial arts again. After this, Retsu and Jaku jump into the ring for the third bout of the final phase. The fight starts in an unusual way, as Jaku offers a handshake to Retsu, even though it was a front to betray him. In fact, Jaku uses this strategy on more than one occasion, but Retsu beats him up. However, Jaku manages to break Retsu's arm thanks to this strategy, earning the hatred and contempt of all the spectators. However, Jaku confesses that he has done that because the match would not have been even if Retsu used both arms, as he considers him superior. Jaku apologizes and asks Retsu to accompany him to Japan when it's all over, as he considers him extremely talented. However, after seeing Retsu's incredible talent in action, Jaku has the strangest and most unpredictable idea of all. Jaku offers to heal Retsu's elbow, revealing that he hadn't broken it, just dislocated it. For some reason, Retsu agrees and to everyone's surprise, Jaku heals his rival's arm. After this, Retsu takes the lead again and hits Jaku ferociously to the point that Jaku decides to change strategy again. Jaku turns his back on Retsu and kneels on the ground while covering his head, leaving everyone in the place stunned including Retsu. This is nothing more than a trap to provoke Retsu as Jaku takes the cessation of attacks as a surrender on Retsu's part. Obviously, it was all an alibi to counterattack. Obviously, Retsu is enraged and after carrying out a beastly flurry of attacks, performs a virtuoso move to force Jaku back to his feet. Retsu puts an end to the bizarre bout once and for all, knocking Jaku out with a single blow. Nevertheless, Retsu praises Jaku's philosophy, who constantly teaches that martial arts are used by the weak to stand up to the strong. The entire arena cheers Jaku's peculiar performance and Retsu helps him out of the ring as a sign of respect. In fact, Jaku is praised even by his teammates, who show no rancor for the defeat, as Retsu is on another level. After a brief wait, the bout between Muhammad Jir and Han takes place. Muhammad Jir takes the lead quickly and manages to damage his foe's face, although the latter seems to completely ignore this fact as he considers Muhammad Jir's fighting style inferior. However, Han is forced to swallow his own words immediately, as Muhammad Jir makes it clear that he does not need to use kicks to defeat him. In fact, Han does his best to get to his feet after being humiliated by Muhammad Jir, but quickly realizes that the fight is already over for him. This causes great sadness among the viewers because China won't be able to continue competing in the tournament. However, everyone is surprised when Yujiro enters the ring as if he's getting ready to fight. After this, Yujiro tells the audience that Kaku is worthy of his admiration, so he'll completely forget that his team has already lost and the winning team will be determined between the two of them. Following this, Yujiro takes Kaku for a stroll in his wheelchair while asking him about his martial arts journey. The elderly man reveals that he used to be very different in the past as he underestimated martial arts and only valued physical strength. In fact, Kaku was a kind of bodybuilder who managed to become the strongest man in Asia. However, he changed his way of thinking after being defeated by an elder. After that, Kaku spent the rest of his life perfecting his technique to become a great martial artist, even if it meant giving up the muscles he loved so much. After this grand introduction, the fight begins. Yujiro astonishes everyone by taking the initiative fiercely, but Kaku manages to shift the focus onto himself by performing a virtuoso move that surprises everyone. To survive the attacks of the most feared man on planet Earth, Kaku literally dislocates his jaw. Retsu explains that Kaku is the only living being who has completely mastered Shiori, an ancient technique that involves completely relaxing the body. Retsu exemplifies this perfectly by comparing Shiori to a handkerchief in the air, now even the sharpest knife in the world could cut a silk handkerchief. Ejiro immediately understands how Shiri works by comparing it to a storm, which can break giant trees but cannot break the leaves of the grass. Thanks to this, he manages to devise an effective technique. Yujiro plucks one of Kaku's hairs as a second of tension is enough to make him abandon the Shiri state. This surprises Kaku, so he decides to take the initiative once and for all. Upon receiving the first blow, Yujiro begins to show nervousness as Kaku's blows are slow but lethal. 
In fact, Kaku manages to destroy a wall with a single blow, which raises the hype to the skies. However, Yujiro leaves everyone in the place perplexed by demonstrating that he was able to learn Shori by just watching it in action for a few minutes. Nevertheless, Yujiro only wants to prove that physical strength overcomes any technique, so he will fight with his traditional style. In fact, the entire stadium falls silent when Yujiro takes off his shirt as his muscles are inhuman. Furthermore, to demonstrate that his body is practically indestructible, Yujiro allows himself to be hit by Kaku, causing only a slight reaction from the elderly man. Although Kaku violently strikes Yujiro, he seems to feel absolutely nothing. As if it weren't enough humiliation, Yujiro claps in Kaku's face, leaving everyone in the stadium frozen. This feeling spreads everywhere, as Kaku literally stops breathing at that precise moment. Yujiro goes mad seeing this, as he was just starting to warm up. Indeed, everyone's suspicions are confirmed just moments later when a paramedic enters the ring to assess the old man's pulse. Yujiro leaves the ring without any empathy and breaks the news to his teammates. However, it was all a ruse by the old man who leaves the paramedics speechless by revealing that he is still alive. Additionally, Kaku addresses the members of his team to explain what happened. If one of the combatants loses their life, there are no winners or losers, as the fight is interrupted. Logically, everyone is perplexed. They can question Kaku's methods, but they cannot question his results. Kaku acknowledges that there would be no way to defeat Yujiro, further proving his point, martial arts can save the weak from the strong. After this, the tournament is declared finished, and the spectators leave the stadium filled with euphoria, as they have witnessed an incredible spectacle. During the night, Yujiro and Kaku meet in the ring to exchange compliments. Kaku admits that absolutely no one could defeat him, so he offers him the title of Emperor of the Sea. Yujiro declines, considering that title still belongs to the old man in the eyes of everyone. Additionally, Yujiro tells him that he is satisfied knowing that Kaku won't forget your sea to beating from him. The next day, Baki returns to Japan and enters the world's most famous forest to visit an old tree he has cared for his entire life. However, he is interrupted by Muhammad Jir, who challenges him to a fight. Nevertheless, Baki tells him that he's not trained to fight anyone else as he's not interested in winning or losing. He just wants to defeat his father. Muhammad warns him that there's no real chance of defeating Yujiro, but Baki tells him that's not what interests him. After this, Baki leaves the place. The next day, Muhammad Jiro invites Kozu to a cafe to discuss something important. However, the waifu receives the strangest and most unexpected news. Muhammad Jiro wants to fight Baki to prove to her that she should choose him instead of Baki. In fact, Muhammad even proposes to the waifu, giving Kazu shivers. Naturally, the waifu tells him to stop thinking about such things, but Muhammad shows his obsession and responds that she will end up falling in love with him when she sees Baki being humiliated. In the evening, Muhammad Jiro meets with Yanagi's master to challenge him but quickly realizes that the old man is literally on another level and decides to take the fight seriously. With a single move, Muhammad Jiro manages to knock out Shibukawa, proving that he should not only be known as Muhammad Ali's son. In fact, to confirm this, Muhammad Jiro challenges Dapo, who used to be a profound admirer of his father. Obviously, Dapo was surprised to see Muhammad Jiro's incredible technique, as it is evident that the young boxer has elevated his father's mastery to the highest level. Naturally, Dapo is not going to let a complete stranger humiliate him in that way, so he makes things extremely difficult for him over and over again, making it clear that Dapo's defense is one of the best seen in the anime. However, Muhammad Jiro proves to be a prodigy in the art of counterattacking and delivers an incredible blow to Dapo's face. After this, Dapo is knocked out. The next day, Muhammad Jiro interrupts Baki and Kozu's date to challenge Baki, telling him that he will keep Kozu. Obviously, Baki realizes that Muhammad Jiro is the person trying to take away his waifu, creating a lot of tension in the atmosphere. Kozu tries to tell Baki to ignore Muhammad Jiro's ideas, but Baki responds that there's no need to be nervous since she is free and doesn't belong to anyone. In fact, Baki takes advantage of the situation to accept Muhammad's challenge, and Muhammad leaves the place. The next day, Muhammad arrives at a luxurious restaurant to meet Jack, who eagerly finishes his meal. After this, both fighters look for an isolated place to carry out their clandestine fight. Although both their expectations were sky-high, Jack quickly makes Muhammad bite the dust, filling the young boxer's heart with doubts. If he can't defeat the fearsome Jack Hama, he won't be able to rival Baki. However, Muhammad has nothing but to swallow his pride over and over as Jack literally pulverizes him. Muhammad tries to get up after biting the dust several times, but Jack's ferocity shows no mercy and Muhammad Jira must resign himself to humiliation. The next day, Muhammad meets with Kozu to talk, but he is quickly interrupted by Shibukawa. He makes up a quick excuse to go talk to the old man, arousing concern in the waifu. 
Shibukawa takes Muhammad to a park to make it clear that the previous fight they had was a lie because Shibukawa didn't take it seriously. After this, Muhammad Jura assumes a fighting stance but is immediately overwhelmed by Shibukawa's ferocity, who had been chewing on the bitter taste of defeat for several days. Shibukawa literally sweeps the floor with Muhammad Jura and leaves him in a deplorable state, even though Muhammad Jura had already been on the brick of death against Jack. Days later, Muhammad Jura meets with Kabuzu to give explanations, but the waifu tells him he doesn't have to justify himself. However, Dapo Orochi interrupts the meeting. Obviously, Dapo only visited Muhammad Jura and asked for a rematch. Despite his condition, Muhammad Jura accepts the fight and is humiliated again. Days later, as expected, Muhammad Jura spends time counting the hours to recover, as his body is shattered. However, one of the hotel employees tells him he has visitors, and upon going down, he finds his own father waiting in the lobby. Muhammad Ali spent the last five years training superhumanly to face Muhammad Jr. again, as he was the only person who has ever defeated him in his entire career. Obviously, Muhammad Jr. tells his father that he doesn't have to prove anything to anyone since Muhammad Ali was already very ill when he lost to Muhammad Jr. Nevertheless, the young boxer decides to accept the fight despite being in a deplorable condition. As expected, Muhammad Ali doesn't waste the opportunity and quickly resolves the fight, making it clear that his five-year training has not been in vain. Muhammad Ali takes his son back to his room and tells him not to feel bad for losing four fights in a row, revealing that he has learned about Muhammad Jr.'s humiliating clandestine defeats. Muhammad Ali asks his son to set aside his dream as he doesn't have to prove anything to anyone. He is extremely strong and capable of achieving anything. Obviously, Muhammad Jr. refuses to fulfill his father's protective wish as he has given him an example of overcoming and perseverance, just like the fighters he has recently lost to. Takagawa overhears all this from the other side of the door and enters the room to invite Muhammad Jr. to a fight against Baki, revealing that it was all a plan by Muhammad Ali to see how willing his son was to continue growing as a boxer. Obviously, Muhammad Jr. accepts and Takagawa begins the preparations to organize the match. Muhammad Jr. starts training immediately after this, using a strange method that involves weighting the most injured areas of his body. This forces the body to improve quickly. In fact, while Muhammad Jr. trains hard, his father motivates him by telling him that Baki has accepted the challenge with the condition that Muhammad Jr. shows up in perfect physical condition, leading to the incredible restoration of the young boxer's muscles and bones. Meanwhile, Yujiro and Muhammad Ali officially agree on the match discussing the qualities of their sons. Days later, Muhammad Jr. meets with Kozu to reveal that his disdain for Baki helps him regain his strength because Baki has two things he desires, the championship title and Kozu's love. When the day of the fight arrives, Muhammad Jr. embarks on the journey to the impressive stadium that will host the event. Not only does he start feeling nervous and nauseous during the trip due to the deep questions from the driver, but he literally begins to tremble upon arriving at the stadium. However, the real pressure begins to affect Muhammad Jr. an hour later when he sees the immense audience that gathered at the stadium. To his surprise, the one who appears in front of him is not Baki, but Yujiro. The Ober only showed up to remind him that he must give a worthy fight because in case he forgot the fight he is about to wage will end only when one of them loses their life. Baki interrupts his father and tells him to stop stealing the spotlight, so Yujiro leaves laughing, knowing that the winner of the fight will be his next opponent. The wait comes to an end and the long-awaited match begins. Baki takes the lead quickly, leaving everyone in awe as Muhammad Jr. bites the dust almost immediately. When he stands up, Muhammad Jr. confesses that he won't give up just because he fell to the ground as he has matured thanks to his defeats. Furthermore, he taunts Baki by telling him that he has perfected his father's art, hitting without being hit. Only Muhammad Jr. intends to be able to finish off his opponent without losing his life in the process. Upon hearing this, Baki literally overwhelms Muhammad Jr. with brutal violence, making it clear that he has no problem ending his opponent's life in front of everyone. Seeing the situation, Muhammad Ali intervenes to prevent the tragedy, apologizing to Baki for interfering. However, Baki tells him that he has no problem with that as Junior has already learned the lesson. His philosophy of ending the enemy without losing his life in the process hides great cowardice, as he intends to end the lives of others without risking his own, just as Muhammad Ali did by intervening. After this, Baki challenges Yujiro, telling him that it's time to fight again, stunning the entire stadium. Yujiro leaves everyone speechless by accepting Baki as his rival, clarifying that he will take it as hunting prey. Additionally, he asks Kozu to take good care of Baki and help him stay motivated, as he has become stronger since he met her. Leaving the ring, Kozu tells Baki that he has become a man, but he is still an immature child who wants to show his father that he has become strong. 
However, Baki tells her that he doesn't want to be the strongest of all. He just wants to be stronger than his monstrous father. In fact, he wouldn't mind being the second weakest human in the world as long as his father is the weakest of all. Meanwhile, Muhammad Ali leaves his son alone to help him release his frustration. But Kazu arrives at the scene at that precise moment, and her maternal instinct kicks in, embracing Junior to help him overcome the sadness. As the days pass, Baki and Yujiro train with a single goal in mind, to demonstrate their strength. Days later, Detective Sonoda investigates the lone survivor of a massacre that occurred in one of Japan's maximum security prisons. The young policeman reveals that Yanagi not only managed to survive Yujiro's beating, but also found a way to eliminate the entire police force assigned to monitor him. Sonoda hands the report to his superior, who tells him it's best to continue investigating each of the prisoners who had been sentenced in the previous season, the ones who had escaped to attend the underground tournament. Sonova discovers that Dorian has been taken in by the monks of his temple, as he literally holds the title of Kayo. Despite his deplorable mental condition, Dorian earns significant amounts of money that benefit the temple, as his candy paintings are a hit. However, the most curious thing of all is that Dorian has adopted a constant training posture for his paintings, leading him to gain more than 20 kilograms of muscle mass in just a few days, catching Sonoda's attention. It seems like Dorian is preparing for something. In fact, Sonoda is equally surprised when visiting Doyle's prison, as he learns that Doyle has destroyed his eardrums with his own hands, apparently to develop an incredible sense of touch. Sonoda confirms this theory upon discovering that Doyle has fun catching bats in his cell, even though he can neither see nor hear. As if that weren't enough, Sonoda finds out that, in another part of the world, Sikorsky has taken his gripping strength to a beastly level, as he was able to fold a coin as if it were a piece of paper. In fact, Sonoda sees with his own eyes that Sikorsky can climb smooth walls as if he had suction cups on his fingers. Finally, when visiting the prison where Spectre is held, Sonoda not only discovers that Spectre is undergoing a miraculous recovery, but also that he can literally do the butterfly stroke in a pool filled with a liquid thicker than slime. Obviously, for Sonoda, this can only mean one thing. The prisoners are preparing for an event similar to the one that triggered the escape in the first season. A man stands before cameras and reporters, having been the sole survivor of a serious accident. A reporter asks him if he is aware of the criticisms against him, as an elephant was also killed. He tries to defend himself. Mr. Simon explains that it wasn't a normal animal, but rather, a giant monster. 977 animals and 41 people fell victim to this threat. Simon recalls a man who confronted this animal. He explains how he defeated his enemy using only his fists. After nobody believed him, the man left the room. Days later, he sits quietly having breakfast with his son. His boy expresses his belief in him, and his father's demeanor shifts. Observing the keen interest in his child's eyes, he starts to vividly recount the astonishing fight he witnessed. Mr. Semen boasts of his invincibility, sparking his son's inquiry and suggesting that the younger, the son of this fighter, might wield even greater prowess. A child reluctantly enters a school and faces these tough guys. Suddenly, he pulls out a knife and tearfully demands that they hand over their strongest student. Finally, the strongest student appears and descends the hill. Baki intimidates the child and swiftly pushes him into the water with a swipe of his hand. He then approaches the muscular fighter, extending his hand and promising him that they will be friends from now on. Another character joins the conversation and delivers news about Baki's father. It seems he will have to face his powerful dad, who is known as the Ogre. Then they both arrive at a residential area. They reach Baki's house, and the young man begins to exercise, showcasing his great flexibility. Suddenly, the kid mentions Becky's father, and the young man responds with arrogance yet respect towards his father. Baki takes Rumiana to his basement, a cold and cramped place, where he must face something stronger than a giant African elephant, a praying mantis. Using the shadow fighting technique, Baki conjures an opponent, in this case, the mantis, but scale up to 100 kilograms in weight. His expression changes upon being in the presence of such a beast, and the fight becomes quite challenging. Although not impossible, because our hero eventually finds a clever way, as he strikes at his weak point. A bizarre training, but effective for his progress. General Stratum visits a grand mansion and comes across a pool, where the water flows at 20 kilometers per hour. There, the general notices the ogre swimming as a form of training. This mighty being tells him he's on vacation and asks the general what he wants. The conversation continues by a fireplace, and the general mentions that Baki has been training hard, even defeating an imaginary 100 kilograms mantis. Instead of getting angry, he begins to laugh heartily, finding the situation in which his son found himself utterly absurd. On television, the journalist reports that the current president of America is parading through the same place where Kennedy was assassinated in Texas, aiming to boost his popularity. 
As they closely follow the report, the screen freezes at one point and then the empty car appears. President Bosch has been kidnapped. The kidnapper is Baki, and they both meet in a restaurant. He asks the young man what he demands, and our hero insists on being incarcerated in the maximum security prison in Arizona, where Mr. Unchained is detained. The old man readily complies with his request, and soon thereafter, a trial ensues, fulfilling his objective. Baki finds himself behind bars. Now in prison, the young man is compelled by the guards to undergo endless security procedures. After a brief exchange with the prison director, Baki makes his way to Mr. Unchained's cell. Now they stand face to face, and Baki is taken aback by Mr. Oliva's appearance. Despite being an inmate, he is surrounded by luxuries. Baki then requests a confrontation as a training exercise to finally defeat his father. Mr. Oliver responds that he will have a battle in two weeks against a fellow inmate, and suggests that our hero meet him in person. In the room, he encounters Iron Michael himself presenting a different image to the one idealized by the protagonist as he seems somewhat cowardly. Behind him emerges an elderly man and further along on the bed lies a giant man. Baki will have quite a peculiar company in prison. The next day, upon waking up, he finds himself face to face with an individual over two meters tall. He then calls for Mr. Second, whom our hero had hoped to speak with the day before. Despite feeling intimidated, Baki challenges him to a fight. Their conversation is cut short as they are interrupted by a security guard. Later in the dining hall, a burly inmate confronts Mr. Second. Quickly, the young man snatches a gun from a guard and then hands it to his opponent. Thinking he has the upper hand, the second deceives him by kicking him in his groin. Afterwards, he challenges him to a sumo-style fight in the gym to match his opponent's level, and he can do so because the guards obey his every command. This fight is much more brutal as the second tears his opponent's ear using part of his hair. With no balance, the sumo fighter is helpless, being defeated once again. The second most powerful inmate in the prison leaves the scene, and then one of the guards shoots the sumo wrestler. Not his lucky day, I guess. Baki and the young man meet again, and the brawny inmate shares his reasons for wanting to defeat Mr. Oliva, as he leads a ridiculous lifestyle. Later, Baki tries to outsmart the guards to display his arrogance to his opponent and is reprimanded, although he couldn't care less. Then the old man arrives to bring him food and proceeds to tell him the story of Mr. Second, who is actually a former president of a South American country named Jun Gavaru. In his youth, he was involved in piracy, but upon witnessing the plight of his country under capitalism, he announced his intentions to forcibly gain independence. Although the President of the United States disagrees with his plan as George Bosch seeks to colonize the country. Soon, they are all surprised by one of Guevara's men, who is part of his personal security and threatens the President to stop his plans or else he will provoke a terrorist attack. Under this and other threats, Jun Guevara fulfills his mission to gain independence for the small island. After three days of isolation, Baki returns to his normal life in prison. After working very hard, he shares lunch with the famous boxer. Under the orders of the prison director, he hires three thugs to assassinate Iron Michael, as he is soon to be released from prison, and they want to prevent a prisoner from winning the World Boxing Championship. They start to intimidate him with words, and then when Iron Michael least expects it, they begin to fight. Despite being the champion, it's an unfair battle, and he receives constant critical blows. The man retreats to a corner and assumes a boxing stance, which his enemies also mimic. The blows are getting harder, but our hero still stands. He falls to the ground, blood spilling from his nose, and suddenly one of the enemies grabs him from behind, while the others take advantage of the situation to throw dozens of kicks to his face. After rendering him completely unconscious, one of the brothers pulls out a knife to cut his tendons, but is interrupted by a projectile that then embeds itself in the wall, announcing the arrival of Mr. Second, who approaches slowly rolling. While the brothers are somewhat uneasy with his presence, the former pirate reminisces about his old days as a crew member. During this distraction, the villains seize the opportunity to plan a new attack. Jun starts urinating on one of the brothers, draws a circle, and then lies down on the floor. The others don't quite understand the situation, but they take advantage and begin mercilessly beating his face. Now it's our hero's turn to counterattack, and his strength is such that he emits a white light around him. They try to intercept him again, but this time Mr. Second hits one of them with such force that it breaks his teeth. One of the brothers sees the monster in front of him and urinates himself, then runs away scared. Iron Michael approaches him and thanks him for saving his life and his boxing career. Later that same night, as our heroes are in their cell, Mr. Oliva finds Gavaru and smashes the door to speak with him. The strongest man in the prison compliments the man in front of him and tells him that they both have something in common. They don't like to lose a fight. Mr. Second asks his opponent why he fights, and the strongman responds that it's for a woman. Suddenly, Baki intervenes in the conversation as he has lost patience listening to this nonsense. 
But due to the young man's arrogance, he is struck and thrown out of the room. Mr. Oliva shows him the handkerchief that reminds him of his beloved and also invites him to smell it. Gevaru does the unthinkable and spits on it, provoking the anger and tears of his future opponent. Mr. Second is greatly surprised to learn that Unchain has his beloved living with him in the prison. On the other hand, the elder mentions that neither he nor anyone else has ever seen her. We see Mr. Oliva getting ready in front of the mirror, dressed formally. He leaves that room and heads towards Maria, his wife, with a bouquet of roses in his hands. John Gavaru suggests that it's Unchain's imagination at work. The others in the prison share the same opinion but refrain from saying it because the prison's number one would kill them all. Then the young man hands a vial to the burly Kent and orders him to give it to him in the arena. Maria throws a cigarette at her husband's head and begins to insult Mr. Oliva for a long time. He tries to calm her down, but she throws a bottle of alcohol at his head. In the end, she tells him, I love you, and he loses his head with excitement. And you know what happens next. In the morning, everyone gathers in the prison's large courtyard to witness the fight. The elder mentions to Baki that Mr. Oliva will bring his girlfriend that same day. Soon, Mr. Second is present at the scene and approaches the center of the arena with his vase in hand. Mr. Unchained walks with something resembling a coffin on his back, and it seems too heavy even for him. What appeared to be a coffin was actually a bed, and on top of it lies his lover. Finally, he decides to show his wife for the first time. She is extremely obese to the point of being gigantic, leaving literally all the inmates stunned. Mr. Unchained flexes his muscles, tearing his clothes apart, to then display his physique for the fight. Meanwhile, the young man mentions that Oliva has a very beautiful mistress, and then he opens the mysterious vial that will give courage and special powers to our hero, then he closes the lid and the fight begins. They then decide to compete in a tub-of-war game with a handkerchief, which they both have to hold onto one corner. Mr. Second starts hitting him, but Biscuit Oliva doesn't let go of the handkerchief. He won't give up so easily, they both change their grip to hold the fabric. The young man holds a piece of facial hair in his other hand, and throws it directly into his opponent's eye. After distracting him with this strategy, he grabs him and throws him into the air, hoping he'll drop the handkerchief. But the plan fails and Biscuit lands on his feet. Just when it seemed like the fight was going to become endless, something causes Mr. Oliva to lose focus because he sees Baki lying next to his wife. While he cries and gets distracted, he is struck in the face by his opponent. He also tries to disrupt Unchained's orientation by using his hair, but he is interrupted and with a palm strike is thrown into the prison corner. Biscuit Oliva thanks Baki because thanks to the jealousy he felt, he summoned his utmost strength to defeat Jun Gavaro. Mr. Second surprises everyone when he tries to get up to fight again, and the real fight begins when Gavaru rushes towards his opponent and strikes him with a swift kick. Mr. Oliva identifies a weak spot in his opponent's fighting patterns and delivers a slap to Gavaru's face, leaving him with a distorted appearance. Meanwhile, the ogre arrives in the United States to propose to Jun Gavaru's security employee that he wants to fight against his boss, the president of the small island. Immobilized, the young man finds himself once again on the ground, defeated by his opponent. Looking up at the sky, he realizes that it's time to abandon his desires to be the number one within the prison. Suddenly, memories of his country's people begin to appear in his mind, images of poor and hungry individuals. To not disappoint the population of his small island, Guevara decides to give it another try. Witnessing his opponent's determination, Mr. Oliva begins to increase his strength, his veins bulging with effort. Mr. Second summons a power that equals his strength to the core of the earth and releases that energy in a single lethal blow. Later, the President of the United States approaches Jun and forgives him on his knees. Now he can be the President of his country, and he will also achieve total independence. Someone else wants to thank him as the ogre appears in the prison yard. He then acknowledges that Guevara is actually the strongest man on earth, his son reinforces this claim and they laugh together. In the end, it all turns out to be an illusion and his face is being crushed on the ground. Mr. Oliva declares the fight over and then approaches Baki, who acknowledges that he's facing a man who is too strong. The winner theorizes that Gavaru didn't win due to his lack of love for muscles, something that Oliva does respect. His power is such that he must restrain himself so that it can expand even further, and if he manages to release this energy for just a few seconds, he doesn't know what might happen. After Becky responds arrogantly, the champion lifts him into the air. With a blow, he is thrown towards a wall, but Baki is more cunning and lands on his feet. He then receives apologies from his future opponent and admits he has exaggerated. Olevo approaches Maria and tells Baki the real reason why he wants to be the strongest man in the world, which is to support his beloved. He then decides to leave while singing a pirate song. Once again, he is the number one. Later, he receives a card addressed to him and his wife, 
When he opens the envelope, he finds a bill with our hero's face on it. A security guard then realizes that he has escaped from prison. Later, on an island, some workers are cutting trees and Jun Gavaru joins them, surprising them with his arrival. Back in the prison, the guards gather all the inmates and try to lower their morale. Baki arrogantly asks if he can go out for some fresh air for about five seconds, and the dumbfounded guard is knocked out with a kick. The other guard draws a gun and Baki also knocks him out within seconds. Soon, Baki easily escapes from the prison, although before doing so finally he is stopped by the prison director and police officers aiming machine guns at him. Later, after threatening everyone with death, he manages to walk towards his master's escape. Then he looks back at the prison and asks them to chain him up again. The young man did this to demonstrate that he could escape without being killed, and now he is the true unchained. Then the doors open. But this time it's Mr. Oliva who comes out riding a motorcycle. Apparently, he has an issue with Baki leaving the prison, and he demands that the security guards remove his handcuffs. He explains that it's unnecessary for them to do so and breaks them in a second. The young man speaks arrogantly to him and Oliva becomes enraged, causing his muscles to grow larger and larger, but fortunately, he manages to calm down. Despite appearing calm on the outside, he is very angry inside because of the young man's arrogance. When Baki leaves, Mr. Oliva smashes his motorcycle to release his tension. Despite this frustration, later they spend a memorable night together with his big wife, Maria. Now we see Baki once again enduring his punishment in prison with those annoying little handcuffs. Someone crosses the door and it turns out to be none other than the strongest man in the place. Apparently, Biscuit Oliva is still angry about his previous encounter with Baki, and now he urinates on his head. Without reacting, Baki simply tells him that in the future, you will have to apologize for this cruel action. The giant fighter is talking to the prison director. Oliver proposes to the man to call the president and have him present at the site because he plans to hold a wrestling competition in the Arizona prison, which will include showcasing martial arts fights. This way, Biscuit explains he will also be able to face Baki. The director gets excited because he knows he will make a lot of money from this event. Later, Unchained gives him the news that Baki wanted to hear. They will fight together in two weeks. The young man is annoyed to wait and starts the fight right there with both thumbs handcuffed. After taking several hits, the great wrestler responds with a slap that sends him through the wall beginning the battle. Mr. Oliva grabs Baki's arm and sends him through the wall to his side. After repeatedly hitting him, he throws him out of the cell with a single punch. Although Baki insists on striking him, his attacks do absolutely nothing to Unchain's body, who remains firm and smiling. Later, they are at a considerable distance, and out of nowhere, Oliva falls to the ground with all his strength. The security cameras show what really happened. And it's that the human eye cannot register the blood we deliver to his opponent, a moment that the video can capture only in slow motion. The fight continues and Baki is now just inches away from Mr. Silva, who is curled up on the floor. He then tries to grab him with great force and Baki becomes really desperate. Now Baki finds himself back on the ground after the damage caused by his opponent, who explains that there are no referees to stop this fight, and the young man says that the outcome of the fight will be decided by the death of his opponent since they are at a point of no return. Baki, as always, speaks arrogantly, and this immediately triggers Unchain's anger. When he tries to use the same technique as moments ago, Baki is able to predict the pattern and hits him forcefully in the nose, making his nemesis fall backward onto the floor. The wrestler's nose bleeds so much that it creates a pool of blood on the floor. Suddenly, the fight is interrupted by Iron Michael, as he warns the young man that if he continues fighting against that giant, he will end up dead. As we can expect from Baki, he ignores him and decides to continue with his battle, despite the danger of death he faces. This danger even motivates him further. They exchange blows repeatedly, and both receive a blow so strong that it distorts their faces. His scent of death is so strong that outside the prison, scavenger birds can be seen waiting for their meal. Baki's determination makes Oliva doubt his own strength. The young man seizes the opportunity and strikes his opponent with his head, managing to break through the wall with his body. Our hero and the security guards now watch an unconscious unchained. Suddenly, Oliva wakes up from the faint, surprised to see Maria standing in front of them. All of you lost, at least he has the relief of being reunited with his wife. The next day, Unchained announces that he has lost a Baki, and that he will no longer be the number one in the prison, he also orders the director to release the young winner. If the director does not comply, 4,000 prisoners will be released. Under this threat, there is no other option. Baki leaves the facility with just a bicycle and a few dollars in his pocket. Baki and the general are at the young man's house, and the elder tells him that he has a tough opponent, even tougher than the most powerful creature on earth, the T-Rex. This individual was found frozen in perfect condition, and next to his body was the corpse of this legendary animal, defeated by the hands of this mysterious individual. 
The chief scientist who found this person demands absolute discretion from them. One of the scientists makes an effort to revive this prehistoric subject, and after 91 days there are still no signs of life. For some reason, this scientist becomes hungry and proceeds to eat a piece of meat from the T-Rex, to be the first human to taste its flavor. The scent of the steak awakens the once-frozen being from 200 million years ago. Alan notices the presence of this monster and remembers he has a gun in the nearby drawer to defend himself. When he sees that everything is getting out of control, he tries to shoot him several times, but realizes it's pointless. The bullets are insufficient to penetrate his strong abdomen. With the bullets in his hands, he throws them at Alan, who gets shot in the shoulder. Just when it seemed like he was approaching to tear him apart, the scientist realizes the monster is demanding something through gestures. He then sees an opportunity to run for his life and heads to the security door to escape, but the prehistoric giant follows behind. Before killing the innocent scientist, he is drawn to something on the other side of the door, and then he mourns the death of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Alan seizes the situation, seeing that the other is now inside the room and decides to lock him in. Later, Alan tells the scientist everything that happened about Pickle, the nickname they chose for the subject. A government official intervenes in the conversation, taking the situation lightly and not paying attention to the consequences of not confronting this beast. Danger arrives sooner than expected because now the monster has destroyed its prison. The government official tries to call for reinforcements, but there's no time for this anymore because the giant starts destroying and killing everything in its path. When the army arrives, the prestigious scientist asks the general to capture it without hurting it, as that beast is more important than the president himself. The general agrees as he is facing a Nobel Prize laureate. The army sees the perfect opportunity to test a new killing machine, but the robot is quickly eliminated by this ancient monster. Soon, more military reinforcements arrive and the general gets off and walks towards his enemy, leaving his clothes behind on the way. The general and the beast become friends through gestures and then shake hands. He plans to take it to Japan. Now the nickname Pickle is escorted by the army as he walks. Baki watches the situation from the TV and is impressed to see his future opponent. Later, outside a US military base, furious citizens are protesting against the presence of this ancient being. The army does nothing but guard their words and protect the monster. Suddenly, the ogre arrives, who now wants to see the beast. As he approaches the compound, the soldiers block his path. At the same time, we see Pickle, who is inside a room with poor decoration. Upon receiving an undesired response, the father of Baki unleashes a small percentage of his power to make the soldiers fight among themselves. After witnessing this scene for a moment, Yujiro Hamo walks towards the entrance and easily breaks down the door. He's not the only one who wants to enter without permission because another mysterious individual has the same desire. With perfect stealth, he manages to infiltrate the place where Pickle is locked up. Someone enters before him, and it turns out to be Kosho Shinoji. While they both talk about Pickle's supposed inhuman strength, another individual named Dapo emerges from the dinosaur-themed decor, who has exactly the same mission as them. It seems that everyone is obsessed with fighting against this new individual. Some more characters emerge who were previously hidden. When they approach to see where Pickle is, they notice that he is sleeping despite the annoying noises. Then he wakes up and leaves everyone amazed by his great height. Then the ogre shows up in a place and tries to break through the glass with his own body, and manages to do it with ease. Then their fists clash, and an energy emerges that emanates throughout the room. Just when a great duel seemed imminent, the army orders everyone to leave the place and one of the soldiers kindly asks Yujiru not to interact with Pickle, as he is a living world heritage. Baki goes to a Kung Fu dojo to learn from the best, who, as we remember, was also the one who infiltrated Pickle's cell the day before. The young man asks him to teach him that martial art, but Retsu refuses because all he is interested in is fighting against the man from the Jurassic period. The general has an idea in mind. He wants to organize a fight between Retsu and Pickle. In the event that Retsu dies, he will inevitably be eaten as if he were prey. Professor Payne naturally does not approve of this confrontation. After non-stop complaints, they both silence him. Retsu finally steps forward, and his opponent is eager to start the fight. With a simple blow, he throws him into the corner. The Chinese fighter is not easily intimidated and kicks him directly in the face. The monster receives many more blows, and then cries. Now it's his turn to strike, and after doing so, he bites his enemy, leaving a large open wound. Retsu laments to tears because 4,000 years of martial arts have had no effect on his opponent. Now he changes his strategy and tries to rely more on his instincts than on his millennia-old skills and after several critical blows, he manages to bring Pickle to the ground. When the fight seems over, Pickle rises again, this time assuming the stance of a quadruple animal. Advancing towards his enemy, he launches an attack that leaves Retsu completely unconscious. Pickle approaches his enemy, crying as he feels sad that he must devour him alive. 
Without hesitation, he carries out his objective and starts eating Retsu's body in pieces. Fortunately, thanks to the professor injecting him with a tranquilizer, he only managed to eat his leg and the Kung Fu fighter remains alive. He now feels disappointment because he broke the promise he made to Pickle. If he died, he would be eaten whole. Baki later arrives to visit Retsu and after hearing what happened, he gives words of motivation and encouragement to the warrior, who receives them gratefully. Outside the hospital, thoughts of battle invade Baki's mind as he increasingly yearns to face this ancient being. Later that night, all members of the Itsuji base learn that Retsu is devoured by Pickle. The professor and his company can't believe what happened, as even though they injected him with anesthesia, the monster managed to escape from that place. The last person capable of doing that was Yujiru. Now free and after stealing someone's clothes, a monster walks through the city streets, although this height doesn't go unnoticed. He's completely amazed by the city lights and the large crowds. While trying to cross the street, he's hit by a truck. His anger is such that he swiftly advances towards the vehicle and completely destroys it within seconds. Upon opening the truck, he finds a lot of meat, which he begins to eat without hesitation. Katsumi, upon finding Pickle, asks him to accompany him. The monster completely ignores him, but the young man insists on asking him not to go any further. He starts hitting the monster, but none of the blows have the slightest effect. Pickle defends himself and with just one kick knocks his enemy unconscious. Another man stands in his way, Hanayama, who is very strong. When Pickle tries to defeat him, the man stops him with his body. This brings memories to his opponent as he assimilates the strength of his opponent with that of a Triceratops. A smile forms on the Jurassic Man's face as he longed for an opponent with such strength. Just as they seem to be about to have an incredible fight, Hanayama ends the confrontation and tells Baki that he's late. Our hero tells Pickle that he was eager to meet him and they fist bump causing the young man to dramatically spin in the air. This makes Baki have a strong desire to kick him in the face, then they both decide to walk together. Now they are on the battlefield and Baki knows very well that Pickle brought him there to fight to the death. As the young man begins to reflect on previous battles, his opponent delivers an unexpected kick, enough to render him unconscious. Believing he has won, Pickle begins to dance in a strange manner. Katsumi trains relentlessly for the battle he anticipates having against the beast, but he is interrupted by Retsu, his former coach, who warns him that he may not win the battle. Despite wanting to fight without a guaranteed victory, the young man decides to proceed anyway. Seeing the determination of his former disciple, Retsu proposes that they train together, Retsu with his Kung Fu skills and Katsumi with his Karate skills. Baki recalls the battle from the previous night and states that he won't be able to sleep for a while, as the desire to fight again with such a powerful opponent will keep him awake. He still bears the mark of the kick on his chest. Meanwhile, the great beast is now asleep, having been sedated with liters of chloroform. The old man, observing the sleeping beast, theorizes that it stays here by its own decision, as there is nothing threatening it, and it knows it will be brought food regularly. Despite being sedated with so many chemicals, the monster wakes up without any issue. Meanwhile, Retsu teaches his companion about a whip, explaining that it's a weapon capable of surpassing the speed of light when used. He explains that it can replicate a strike at that same speed against opponents. He can also do this with his fists, and thoughtfully he asks if this will be enough to defeat Pickle. Retsu replies that it won't be, but if combined with more strength and speed, it could inflict significant damage. Later, Professor Kayo arrives from China to teach the young man some new skills. Katsumi prepares for the fight and crosses paths with Baki, was covered in blood but still maintains his usual brave and arrogant demeanor. Baki tries to demoralize him, telling him he won't be able to win, but Katsubi presses on for the fight and finds himself in a stadium filled with cheering spectators. Katsumi walks with courage on his face, and the fight begins immediately, as the beast attacks him by surprise. Without wasting any time, Katsumi starts hitting him relentlessly. Pickle seems like he's going to grab him, but the young man strikes him in the groin and then finishes him off with an attack to the chin. The monster tries to attack, but our hero executes the punch that replicates the speed of light, leaving the enemy on his knees. Then he does it once more. Unfortunately, the sacrifice of being able to deliver those blows results in completely broken feet and hands. Despite the disappointment of everyone in the audience, Katsumi still has another power to use, one that only he has been able to master, the Ultra Punch. After charging the attack, he executes it effectively, once again leaving the Jurassic monster on the ground. Our hero shatters his limbs, this time his entire arm as he emulated the whipping motion of a whip, leaving his bones exposed. After approaching Pickle, he raises his arm announcing his victory because he is the only one standing. Then the crowd adores him. The happiness fades away when he realizes that Pickle was merely sleeping, not defeated. Despite everything that happened, Katsumi feels pride because he understands that Pickle 
considers him a powerful opponent and a friend. Now Katsumi tells Pickle to kill him, as it is what should happen. The monster swiftly tears off his broken arm and leaves him bleeding on the ground. Then he approaches him and gives him a gesture of forgiveness and regret as he has faced a weaker opponent than himself, and now he feels pity and empathy, something that makes him human. Fortunately, our hero is still alive and recovering from all the injuries. Then Baki arrives to see his friend. Katsuni is glad but stops him to ask if he will resume the fight where he left off. Baki faces his friend assuring him confidently that he will. The next day, Baki is training when something unprecedented happens. He cannot imagine and replicate Pickle to fight against him due to his immense power. Later, Retsu shows up in our hero's room and nervously laughing, he asks his companion what the heck Pickle is, excited about fighting against someone incredibly powerful. After calming down, he tells Retsu that he will see Pickle in person tomorrow, leaving his friend in great shock. Then a new character makes an appearance at the site where Pickle is being held captive. The monster gets excited because this opponent is not like the other weaklings, so he sees him as an interesting toy. Quickly, the enemy lunges towards him. Both show their fangs and then they leap into the air to bite each other. Pickle exerts so much force over the youngster that he begins to spin him around and finally tears off his lips. The beast swallows his face as if it were a snack. He has not yet surrendered and his opponent unexpectedly receives a massive punch to the jaw. Now both enemies exchange threatening glares before starting the fight. Pickle advances at great speed, but he is deflected by a move from his enemy. Then he approaches and smashes his face against the stadium seats. He then effortlessly throws him to the ground. This new enemy is so strong that with just one attack, he manages to cut off Pickle's ear. Now it's the monster's turn to attack and he strikes in such a way that he manages to break the bones of his opponent's face. He then celebrates his victory with a dance. However, his joy doesn't last long as he breaks into tears like times before. As he is approaching to devour him, a memory of his fear of giant insects comes to his mind. Feeling this way, he decides to retreat without further action. Since childhood, he had to fight against giant bees without any protection. After eating a dead bee, the man became completely paralyzed, so this somewhat traumatic memory was etched in his mind. Now both old men are in the hospital, having saved Jack's life. Although his health is stable, he will be left with many scars. A doctor announces that Jack has escaped, and he is now facing Pickle again. He apologizes to the monster for withdrawing in the middle of the fight. After hitting him repeatedly, the beast becomes scared and decides to flee in the midst of the battle, as he's afraid. Apparently, Jack's power is unnatural, due to the abuse of steroids and other drugs that make him strong. Later, when he calms down, he spins Jack like a top with a blow, and then he falls head first onto the asphalt. Once again, he falls into a coma, losing twice in one day for the first time. Jack wakes up again and tries to escape but runs into Baki in the hallway. Then, in an attempt to prevent him from joining the battle, Baki explains that Pickle doesn't kill him because he wants to eat him later, which is why he leaves him alive. This triggers the warrior's tears, his face in pieces. Then the ogre is seen with the old man sharing a meal, and the old man asks if Baki will be able to defeat the monster. The ogre says he will be able to do it because he is his son. Then he leaves, stating that he will devour the last one standing. The professor explains that they are trying to replicate the meat of the Tyrannosaurus Rex so that Pickle can always eat and be satisfied, thus he won't fight anymore. Then we can see Baki advancing towards where Pickle is and then slapping him. The monster goes from peace to rage in seconds and immediately attacks the young man. Our hero sees the opportunity and kicks the offended beast in the face. Baki mercilessly beats him and nearly chokes him to death. But that doesn't happen because Pickle regains consciousness and runs to the wall and then climbs up to the ceiling, causing both to fall with their own weight. Baki relishes the moment of ecstasy. Both then receive a heavy impact. Baki momentarily loses consciousness, but Pickle gives him a tap that brings him back to normality. Despite feeling pain all over his body, the young man appears calm on the outside. Our hero soon recovers and starts giving his opponent a beating. After inflicting blows similar to those of a whip, Pickle goes on the defensive, burning in anger because his pride has been tarnished. Now Baki dominates the battlefield with a new stance, Kokaiken, and then demonstrates other skills using the martial art of Kung Fu. Finally, he shows that he can emulate a Triceratops. After summoning more dinosaurs from Pickle's perspective, the young man fews all the beasts that he feared millions of years ago. While Baki's face shows bravery, the giant beast's face displayed absolute horror. Pickle propels his legs against a corner, something no human has ever achieved before. In less than a second, he lunges at Baki, but the young man cleverly manages to dodge in time, leaving him shattered against the hard stadium seats. Baki still has a chance to defeat his opponent. 
Even after receiving a blow that would immediately kill anyone else, Pickle remains standing, eager to continue fighting our young hero. Baki tries to provoke his enemy's rage by urinating in his territory, as the young man has intuited that Pickle is a highly territorial species. Arrogantly, he approaches the beast and tells it that he's tired of using his new abilities and wants to fight like a homo sapiens hand to hand. The monster crushes him to the ground without hesitation, leaving him lying in a strange pose. Then it crushes him repeatedly to leave him lifeless, unleashing all the fury within. Fortunately, Baki manages to defend himself from each blow, but he still affirms that he's facing a very strong fighter. Its strength is such that even when the protagonist shields himself, it sends him flying through the air. After reflecting for a moment, Baki manages to land firmly on his feet with determination in his gaze. Something surprising happens when the beast attacks the young man, he dodges absolutely every strike. Do the blows bounce off his body or does he dodge them at a speed that the human eye cannot perceive? At one point even lunges at the young man and passes through him, as if Baki weren't really standing there. The reality is that he moves at such a speed around the monster in just seconds that it seems like he's always in the same place. Then he appears behind it and Pickle manages to react in time to jump away. Burning with fury, it continues to persist in striking him, but only throws attacks into thin air. It seems Baki doesn't tire as quickly as it seemed. Then he pulls a dirty move, replicating the grip of the sword, he delivers a powerful blow to its weakest point. Its face betrays the immense pain it feels, which he does not seem to enjoy at all. The pain is more intense than it anticipated, and it begins to roll in circles. Retsu explains that the reason for its profound pain is due to the fragility of that sensitive part, as technically, it is the most unprotected organ of the human body, more fragile in the heart. Slowly, it manages to rise with a diabolical look, while Baki laughs nervously and tensely is also trembling. The enemy assumes a stance that the young man understands as its final transformation. Now Pickle tenses every muscle in his body, a battle even tougher than the previous one is about to begin. As he repositions his entire body in this new phase, he appears larger and more powerful than before. Baki genuinely feels gratitude towards his opponent, considering it an act of friendship. The young warrior screaming makes it clear that he is not afraid, and that he won't tire until he wins or dies. Despite being inferior in height, strength, and endurance, Baki can stand up to him because he has the necessary technique, which he has been perfecting for years. Both feel a strong connection because they have gone through the same in life, enduring pain and the blows inflicted by their enemies in the past. The monster, with tears in its eyes, attacks the young man, and our hero perceives everything in slow motion, allowing him to choose any counterattack. Next, he delivers a direct blow to the face. Now Baki keeps the beast cornered. Its size advantage doesn't matter much. Pickle tries to flee at a speed invisible to the human eye, but Baki is determined to pursue and strike him relentlessly. They lock eyes and fist bump as a sign of respect and admiration for the moment they're experiencing. The fight continues and it's unclear who is hitting whom. Then the young hero ends up knocked out on the ground and Pickle is sitting down. The monster rests because he has finally defeated Baki. Later he stands up, then leaves without saying a word. Later on, both young men find themselves at the top of a building, apparently Pickle's favorite spot. They both enjoy the view offered by the Great Heights. Several days later, at the United Nations organization, the decision of what to do with Pickle was finally made after counting a billion votes, basically, to return him to where they have found him, frozen. Although the professor disagrees with this decision, he respects the voting outcome. Something doesn't go as planned as Pickle decides to escape from Tokyo, fooling everyone. Now we see Baki in a hospital, where he's undergoing health studies after a tough fight. The doctor explains he's suffered multiple bone fractures, but he's recovering in good condition. After being surprised by the results of Baki's brain scans, the doctor calls in a neurosurgeon to try to understand what's happening. Both are impressed to see such a different and unique brain, almost demonic. Baki meets a girl he hasn't seen in a long time, and they walk together to school. As a sign of affection, she kicks him in the backside, and then they intertwine their fingers. The next day, a very unexpected confrontation occurs as the Ober pays a visit to Unchained in prison. When this powerful fighter attempts to launch the first attack, he's unable to do so as he receives a massive punch to the face. The fight doesn't last long as Oliva is defeated shortly thereafter. Sometime later, the Prime Minister of Japan orders Yujiro to be eliminated once and for all, as he is currently a danger to the world. Then Stratum is chosen to confront Beki's father, and he arms himself to the teeth to carry out his mission. Once again, he sticks to the same tradition of trying to kill Yujiro every year, even though he always fails. The American soldier thinks that this time he'll be able to defeat him. As he heads to the location where he must face the monster, he looks around to predict an enemy attack. But the ogre appears to him by surprise. 
The villain laughs in his face, due to the clothing he is wearing for the occasion. Unlike the villain himself who only uses his bare hands as a weapon. With little effort, he manages to defeat Captain Stridum, as he has destroyed all of his weapons in just seconds. Another who seeks to confront the ogre is his own son, who now replicates him with his imagination for training. Although he will need to train much harder, because even the projection of his father has defeated him shortly after starting the fight. If this happens in training, the young man cannot imagine what can happen on the battlefield. Days later, they meet again at a city restaurant and Stridham informs Yujiro that Baki wants to meet him. The ogre asks what he wants, and Stridham replies that his son wants to organize a dinner together, something that infuriates his father, who expected violence and hatred from his son. Out of anger, he begins to bend spoons and break things in the restaurant. He becomes even more nervous when Stratum tells him the details of what Baki wants to eat for that dinner. Feeling embarrassed, he walks away from the restaurant without saying a word. Although when he's outside, he considers the proposal in silence. The Prime Minister of Japan convenes in a room with the President of the United States called Barack Ozma. Both are seeking a way to eliminate Yujiro, and at one point the idea of using Baki to carry out this plan is proposed, since the young man, according to the minister, has the power of a massive national weapon. However, their conversation is swiftly interrupted by the villain himself, who regards them with arrogance. Now, Ozma, completely remorseful for the decision he has made, swears allegiance to the ogre. Pledging the constitution, as president, he promises to have a friendly relationship with Yujiro Hama. Having made his stance clear, he departs but not without warning them not to stand in his way and much less with his family relationship. We see how Baki, after another of his grueling training sessions, decides to prepare something to eat. After finishing everything, he imagines a conversation with his father and all Yujiro emits when speaking are unintelligible words and strange sounds. His father throws the table into the air and Baki goes on the defensive. Apparently, any situation he imagines with Yujiro ends in a fight. After that strange situation, the young man decides to leave his house, but before that, he runs into his love interest. For a moment, she becomes jealous as she hears our hero talking aloud, but then retracts her statement. Baki suggests to the young woman that if she's concerned, she should spend more time with him. Something remarkable happens when Baki is preparing coffee in the morning. His hair spikes up within seconds, and he knows exactly what that means. His father is about to pay him a visit. The boy's anxiety is justified as Yujiro Hama has never visited Baki before. He prepares cups for both of them, and as he heads towards the dining area, his father is already seated. While the ogre drinks his coffee, the young man can't believe what's happening, and he's excited inside. Yujiro asks Baki if he has ever feared him, and our hero responds that he has always harbored horror towards his father, but he also admires him. The ogre seeks to tense the situation and insults Baki for serving him a horrible coffee. He does this because he wants to have a fight with our hero, or at least, make him angry. To the villain's surprise, his son kneels down and asks for forgiveness. He also adds that since Yujiro drank the whole coffee in just two sips, it couldn't have been so bad after all. Yujiro is shocked that makes it clear that family harmony isn't his thing. His son lowers his head and expresses a desire for him to make coffee. To this request, Yujiro stands up and smashes the table into many pieces with his fingers. He informs his son that he'll only make him coffee if he manages to defeat him, adding with a smile that he'll also cook for him and leaves. The young man stands there, not uttering a single word. Apparently, the meeting didn't go as Baki had hoped. Our hero feels a roller coaster of emotions between anxiety and relief, and without thinking, he goes outside and demands that his father close the door more slowly next time. The ogre smiles and admits he's right. Baki is dying to tell him to come back and close it again, but he knows he's already said too much, so he returns home. As Baki walks peacefully through the city, he encounters an enemy eager to challenge him. When the fool removes his coat, he reveals a large tattoo on his back. Hinting that he is a dangerous member of the Mafia, although our hero doesn't care about this in the slightest. Clumsily, the enemy tosses a cigarette to distract Baki and attempts to strike him, but Baki's strength far surpasses his, and he swiftly knocks him down in less than a second. In his memories, Shiharu is forced to fight against the young man by orders of Hanayama. Even if he had wanted to refuse, he had no other choice. The weak enemy gets back on his feet, but Baki warns him that it will be the last time he'll hit in without hurting him, Chihara's pride burns, and he tries to strike the young man only to receive multiple attacks and fall back to the ground. Baki once again wonders why he came to hit him, but he doesn't dwell on it too much and leaves his opponent kissing the pavement. Later, something surprises our hero as his opponent now stands with arms crossed outside his house. He hasn't had enough yet. His feeble foo challenges him to another fight, but this time Baki decides to refuse as he lacks a reason to battle his opponent, a sentiment shared by Chiharu who is obliged by his boss to do so. 
Despite this, he decides to fight anyway and with a single punch, the young man's head drops directly to the ground. Baki orders him to leave his house as soon as he recovers. Though he didn't see it, from inside his house, he knows the weakling enemy hasn't given up so he steps out to teach him a lesson, but instead receives a punch to the face. Now our hero's interest is piqued, for that blow wasn't from a novice. He seizes the opportunity and begins to relentlessly throw and strike him. Despite being an amateur, Baki senses that his opponent possesses considerable power and fighting spirit. Now he has truly captured the young man's attention. Chiharu attempts to strike again, some blows hitting the young man's body while others bounce off or cause him too much pain in his hand. Now in a bad mood, Baki resumes his activities, while the enemy asserts that the fight will only end when one of them admits defeat. When he steps out of his house to see if his enemy is there, he's relieved but later encounters him on the way to the market. The young man strikes him before Chiharu can even finish a word. Baki suggests to his opponent that they fight using each other's styles to make things more interesting. After pondering for a few seconds, the Yakuza member loses patience, believing that Baki could mimic him, seeing this as an insult. When he attacks, the young man makes a clumsy move that causes the enemy to break his fingers. The same happens after a kick. Our hero's body is like steel. Baki admires his opponent's fighting spirit, which could surpass that of a black belt in any martial art. Baki lunges towards the enemy, moving so swiftly that Chiharu hasn't had time to close his hand, causing him to sink his fingers into his eyes. Our hero is seriously injured, but he maintains a smile, eager to continue fighting using Chiharu Shaiba's style. Later, he finds himself alongside Kaoru Hanayama, explaining what happened on that long day of fighting. His boss thanks him for following the rules, but the young man responds that not only did he not win, but he couldn't even counterattack his enemy. Although he acknowledges that in the final round, he managed to land several blows, which is significant considering his opponent is Baki. Meanwhile, Baki is lying on his bed, recovering his eyes with ice. The next day, the Ogre surprises Stridum by informing him that the fight against his son will take place in a few days. He explains that it won't be a real battle, but rather a father-son affair. The military man ponders for a few seconds, and just as he's about to tell Yujiro that he's gone soft, he quickly snuffs out his cigarette and glares at him with anger. Later, in a bar, Yujiro, amidst drinks, tells Dapo that he's in love with his son, and adds that he's been waiting for this day for a long time. He also has a recurring dream in which he can't lay a finger on his son, as Baki surpasses him in power. Dapo asks if this dream could come true and the ogre replies that it's impossible, which is why it's a dream. At the same time, Baki seeks advice from an elder on whether he should fight his father, and the elder tells him that it's not wrong to avoid a fight against Yujiro as he is no match for him. Despite Shibukawa's words, the young man insists he's mistaken, as it will only be a duel between father and son, thus there will be no winners or losers. While our hero is preparing dinner, the ogre slowly approaches his house. When Baki finishes cooking, Yujiro arrives unannounced for dinner. The young man is taken aback when he realizes that the ogre has bowed to him for making dinner. A gesture he never expected from his father. He thinks to himself that he may have never truly known his father, as he only knows anecdotes told by others about the ogre. After finishing eating, Baki, feeling embarrassed, asks his father if he can clean the dishes, and Yujiro quickly approaches him from behind, Suggesting that if he beats him in rock, paper, or scissors, he'll gladly do it. He loses because his father cheats. Now he sits with his arms crossed since Yujiro invited him to dinner the next day and Baki doesn't know how he should dress. On the following evening, he attends a luxurious place atop a building. Yujiro shows up in formal attire and reprimands his son for coming dressed that way. Baki responds that no one taught him how to dress like that. Instead, his father taught him to be strong and fight. This retort angers the ogre but he chooses to suppress his rage to enjoy the dinner. After that, Baki decides to ask an uncomfortable question. Why did he kill his mother? When Yujiro refuses to divulge that secret, Baki becomes arrogant. The ogre's sudden anger causes an earthquake in the building. After calming down a bit, he forces Baki to sit in a chair. His father initiates the fight his son desires by almost throwing him out the window. Then he hurls him into another room, smashing through the wall. Our hero realizes it's not a fight, it's punishment. Now both are in free fall from the top of the building and crash into a car, shattering it. To everyone's surprise, they both survive. When Baki regains consciousness, he slaps his father across the face. Yujiro returns the slap and sends him flying. Now they stand face to face and Baki is ready to fight with all his might, but something unexpected happens. Yujiro pleads with him to stop lying and show his true potential, as the young man has been holding back all along. He suggests they fight seriously. Baki looks at him with utter terror, but he's also tempted by the idea of having a once-in-a-lifetime fight, 
even if it could cost him his life. Now the young man tries to imitate the maximum speed of a cockroach, and after propelling himself at 270 kilometers per hour, he takes his father with him, and both are thrown out. Despite this, his father's strength still surpasses his, and he stops the momentum with his feet. Becky's persistence is incredible. Even though he's stepping on glass with his bare feet, he doesn't have a single drop of blood. While the enemy ponders this, Baki starts hitting him mercilessly. Yujiro expresses his admiration for this technique and asks where he learned it. After stopping him, he grabs him from behind and throws him into the street. Then the boy is surprised by the large crowd cheering for both of them. The fight continues and it's Baki, who now receives all the blows making him bleed and worst of all, bringing tears to his eyes. Our hero gathers himself again and begins to kick his father, who easily predicts all these blows. The owner interprets this fight as a game between father and son. Yujiro is proud of his son and his bloodline. Now Baki changes his strategy after taking a considerable distance, he assumes the position and ability of a Triceratops. The projection of this ancient animal surprises everyone, especially his father. Even Yujiro watches as Baki fades away, leaving only the presence of the immense dinosaur before him. Our hero launches into the attack, and his father stops him by grabbing him by the horns. The top of building, Pickle watches the situation with great attention. The summoning of this Jurassic animal undoubtedly stirred up some memories from his past. His expression is one of happiness. Now his father implements different techniques, simulating various animals. His son looks at him with terror because he doesn't know what to expect. Even Yujiro explains that it's a skill he invented himself. After tearing his shirt apart, he illuminates everything around him. Baki doesn't understand what's happening. Now he's finally in his strongest form. Later, he offers his son a pat on the back to congratulate him. Baki clearly perceives this as a trap but can't help but cry. Yujiro also wants to pat his head, but the young man decides to suppress those feelings he has never felt before and rejects his father, because this is a fight. With great speed, he approaches his son and paralyzes him with his extreme strength. Despite struggling to escape the situation and kicking, it's impossible. Meanwhile, Yujiro begins to affectionately stroke the young man's head. Then he throws him into the air and now Baki spins like a top. Finally, he kicks him, sending him flying many meters only to land on the ground near the crowd. Once again, the ogre starts hitting him, but this time the young man is left paralyzed, looking up at him from the ground. He tells him he enjoyed the fight and gives him the choice of a final blow, a stomp or a punch. But what neither of them imagines is that Pickle makes an appearance, and he's much larger than Yujiro. He stands in front of him and explains that he has wanted to fight together for a long time, but before he can continue speaking, his son steps forward and punches him in the face, knocking out several teeth and a fang in the process. This naturally unleashes the monster's anger, but what he doesn't expect is that Baki himself is even angrier than him because he has interfered in the fight. The young man ejects him from the sight, and without saying a word, he walks away and sits to watch the fight alongside the crowd, having learned the lesson of not interfering, a law that also applies in the wild. His father is pleased as the fight hasn't ended as he had thought. Now they face each other as their confrontation will escalate in complexity. It will be an entertaining fight for Yujiro, and the most important and challenging one for Baki, who accepts that he is weaker and therefore must resort to deception. His father changes strategy again, giving him five seconds of anticipation before each attack. This time, Baki could devise a plan and manages to hit his father hard. This allows him to keep Yujiro on the ground. Later, he lifts his free arm and buries it in the ground. This unique move manages to get Baki off him. This move was so unique that it caused the boy to wet his pants. Without mercy toward his son, he continues to hit him with great force, leaving him shattered on the ground. The young hero tries to stand up and decides that enough is enough. The ogre approaches him and asks if he wants to keep fighting. Suddenly, they are both interrupted by the appearance of Yujiro's father. The grandfather suggests to his grandson that he actually has the chance to win this fight. To break Baki's spirit, Yujiro decides to use his father's technique to crush the young man's morale, inflicting great pain in the process. Now Baki is a human nunchaku. The speed and force are such that blood pours from all his orifices, turning everything he sees red. Finally, he repeatedly crashes his body into a car, still holding onto it. Despite receiving so much damage, he quickly recovers. His father lunges at him, but he receives a blow to the face, causing him to fly through the air. Despite the pain, Yujiro is excited to see that he is no longer at his peak, and that someone may be able to defeat him at some point. Now they are on equal footing, and they take the fight more seriously. Baki manages to dodge each of his father's blows and counterattacks effectively. After this, something changes in the young man's brain. His father beams with pride and tells him he's a true hammer. 
Suddenly, someone interrupts the fight, and it turns out to be Bakey's girlfriend. A strange way to introduce him to his girlfriend. Despite her pleas, nothing can stop this fight because both know it's about to come to an end. Just when it seems like our hero is about to deliver the final blow, his intention was to climb onto his father's shoulders, as if he were a child. In this same position. Later, they both decide it's time to finish and continue with the fight. Both relentlessly hit each other, blood splattering everywhere. Then the ogre hugs his son so tightly that it causes a loud cracking of Bakey's bones. He manages to break several ribs and other bones, then throws him to the ground. The irony of the situation is that in this same manner, Yujiro murdered Bakey's mother. The ogre withdraws, declaring the fight over. Along the way, everyone in the crowd salutes and pays their respects to the monster. Later, after some reflection, he returns and Yujiro and his son have a meal with food and an imaginary table. Everyone in the crowd is astonished to see that these former enemies now live in total peace. For some reason, Baki throws the imaginary table into the air, surprising Yujiro. Baki tells him he saved his father's life and Yujiro accepts the comment with a smile, saying the miso soup was a bit salty. The ogre admits that finally the young man achieves something no one else could cooking for someone. Yujiro declares to the crowd that the strongest man in the world is Baki. Everyone instantly goes wild. The young man acknowledges his loss but still bows to his father. Both seal this incredible moment with a handshake. The end. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon to get new anime recaps.